2024 is going to be the year that we have a very serious discussion in the financial markets about the Federal Reserve's credibility. What I'm excited about in 2024 is to not hang on every single word that the Fed is saying. Paul thinks the Fed's going to be cutting rates in 2024, but it's possible that the economy could be firmer for longer. If our call is right, more likely to have a soft landing than a recession, clearly not cutting in March of 2024. The Fed is really unlikely to start cutting in March. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. The mic's on. Are we ready for this? We ready? Okay. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. Let's get this year started. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. I'm alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 this morning, negative 0.1%, hitting the ground running for 2024. Payrolls on Friday, the following Friday. Earnings season kicking off with earnings from JP Morgan. Tom, starting the year on a nine-week winning streak on the S&P 500. The, the winning streak, Sarah, it's catch up. I think what's so important here is it wasn't about the big seven, big eight stocks. It was about a catch up being done. And you just wonder what's the character of the follow on if you assume bull market. John Stolfus with us, the Super Bowl in the eight o'clock hour. And you wonder, OK, if we're going to be bullish, what kind of bullish are we going to be? We got to learn how that works out in January. Well, let's talk about the scores of the last 12 months. <clears throat> Lisa, the S&P 500 up by something like 24 percent. The Nasdaq 100 higher by 54 percent. And the range of forecasts on Wall Street coming into this year, you can drive a double decker through them. 4,200 at the low end, JP Morgan, right. 5,200 at the high end, Oppenheimer. And they're all unusual in the sense that they're all predicting a less than a 10% gain <coughs> or loss for the full year. And to me, what I was struck by is that's really rare. We've seen 20 right. points, 20% uh, up, 20% down pretty consistently for the past couple of years. And you'd have to go back to 2016 for a gain below 10%. I think it's important. John really laid out nicely the calls out one year forward. John, I thought over the weekend, over the long holiday, there was way too much short-term analysis. I went over uh, to uh, where we were, 1231 19 from the beginning of COVID, SPX up 12% per year, Dow up 10% per year, NASDAQ up 19% per year with the super 2023. We had a decade in 12 months, Tom. A decade yeah, worth of stories yeah, nicely said. in 12 yeah. months. We had a banking yeah. crisis. Lisa, for about five minutes, moved on from that. We had this story of higher for longer, yields through 5% <clears> on a US 10-year, moved quickly through that. November and December happened. Lisa, we had this AI phenomenon that could continue through 2024 and beyond, maybe for the next several decades. How many stories, how many themes were there? And I mean major themes Ozempic. for 2023. Ozempic, another exactly. one. Exactly. And honestly, We've for New Year's Eve, me. I was going into 2024 and I was thinking, we're going to have a another decade in a year. Think about all the themes that we have set up just for January. Think about all of the potential uh, outcomes, that could be, uh, the, the headwinds that could transpire. To me, that was sort of exhausting to think about. We could have another year of a decade of narrative stuffed into 2024. No time for rest this morning. Wall Street getting back to work. Barclays, Tim Long on Apple, this. We are lowering our rating from equal weight to underweight. The iPhone 15 has been lackluster. We believe the 16 should be the same. We believe the continued period, Tom, of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. This is the key point. You've, you've nailed it and you've nailed it with the one stock people care about is multiple expansion. That was the gift of last year. We'll talk about that through the three hours uh, this morning. But the answer is what character is the bull market this year? Can you get it going with the kind of multiple expansion of the last 12 months? In Apple's case, it was ginormous. Down in the pre-market by 1.6%. Let's get your morning started, your week, your month, your year with some price action. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. On the S&P, we're negative 0.15%. Your 10-year yield, 392.57. It felt like at times, at least, that this bond market was trolling us all. Just to think about everything that was going on last year and then to finish almost exactly where we started 2023. I feel like the entire market's been trolling us considering the fact that with S&P, uh, the whole round trip, we basically are back to where we were in January of 2022. What we're looking at this week is really gonna be massive jobs numbers. And I'm really watching the labor market for clues of whether we're gonna surprise the upside or surprise the downside economically. On Wednesday, we get ISM manufacturing for December. That'll be interesting to watch. But we also get the FOMC meeting minutes and the JOLTS job openings. And I'm watching job openings, even 
week. Now, a lot of people discount this as a sort of non-metric that is highly fudged by people posting three jobs at a time. That said, does it continue to go down, given the fact that people are seeing uh, perhaps a little bit more labor come into the market? Thursday, initial jobless claims and watching continuing claims, which have been ticking up. And on Friday, we get non-farm payrolls as well as ISM services. I am watching how much pay is increasing still. <clears throat> it is still increasing too quickly for the Fed to be at a trajectory where they're cutting rates as aggressively as the market is currently pricing it. For once, the minutes could be interesting, right? <laughs> we Did say they that talk about it? Are they actively oh talking about it? We're told they're I'll not talking about me. it. They're kind of talking <laughs> about okay, it. Okay, but they have to say that they're talking about it at this point because otherwise they discredit themselves completely. If they don't address it and it just is their throw Powell under the bus, at what point are we talking about something that just lacks any right. credibility whatsoever? Right. We're going to have John Stolfus later in Uber point here. He's gone. modeling out. <laughs> John, John's modeling out 11% earnings growth. That's all the Fed's got to know. I mean, the juggernaut continues, and on any number of analysis of real rates, they're way behind it. They got to cut, 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 and we'll see. No, you know, there's a lot of sophisticates don't believe they're going to do that. The biggest bill on Wall Street, John Stolf, is a couple of hours away. We start this morning. We start 2024. I'm pleased to say with Chris Marangi, the co-CIO of Gabelli Funds. Chris, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. There is a range of questions that you ask in your note, and I want to pick up on the last one. I think is the most important. Where the leadership's going to come from? in 2024. Where do you and the team, Chris, believe that leadership will come from? Yeah, so 2023, obviously, the, the leaders were the big tech-enabled companies. They were safe havens, fortress balance sheets, great cash flow, great places to hide out in economic and, and political turmoil. Uh, we still have a lot of that turmoil, obviously, but you've got the Fed uh, wind at your back in 2024. You've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. So I think that gives some room for a broadening out of the market. Uh, small caps had a great December. Uh, I think that probably continues into at least the early part of 2024. So a broadening of, of the market, some of the neglected sectors, neglected uh, size companies. Is there a part of value, Chris Morangi, with all of the Gabelli heritage that is growthy? Is there value value and then sort of growthy value? Yeah, we tend to look at those growthy values. Growth, growth is neither good nor bad. It depends how it's priced uh, and whether it uh, adds value or not to, to the firm. Um, so, yeah, we, we love growing companies. Uh, there, are the, there is the cigar butt investing flavor of value investing where you're looking for companies that are not growing. And we've got plenty of those, too. Uh, but, again, you're looking for uh, what, what's it priced. Give us an example of a growthy value stock. It's not Apple or Microsoft, is it? No, and, you know, some of the sectors, by the way, that we're looking at in 2024 are some of the defensives. There's some growth there as well. Uh, if, if we are going to hit a soft patch, many of those uh, companies were hit by higher rates um, and uh, should look to recover in 24. Those would include some of the staples. Uh, and one growthy staple that we like is Bell Ring Brands, BRBR. -BR. Hope you started your day with a protein shake. That's what they make. Uh, they are That's very Pharaoh does that. Birth Joy Boy does that, you know. Growing over 30 percent, uh, and this thing is just a rocket. Lots of other companies would love to own it, and we think there's some opportunity there uh, for them to be taken over in 2024. One thing that you do so well, Chris, is you do fundamental research, and last year it seems like a lot of fundamental research died. Do you think that this year it'll actually uh, translate into performance that much more at a time where, if you talk about the growthiness, Apple didn't really have sales growth when it came to the actual uh, unit sales. A lot of people are wondering whether they're going to get punished for that, as John was mentioning earlier this morning. Do you think that fundamentals will reconnect with stock performance this year? Well, hope springs eternal at this time of year, always, Lisa. <laughs> and, and I do think that's true. Uh, listen, last year, obviously, you buy seven stocks and, and you did great. Uh, that's going to be a little tougher to do. Um, you know, the, the Magnificent Seven, some of them probably will do well uh, again this year. Uh, but it's not going to be across the board. and It's not going to be to the extent that we saw in 2023. So you're going to have to do some work. And those small caps require a lot of work. They're just... Less, harder to find information about them. You've got to go out and visit them. And that's what we do. And that's where we think we can add value this year. Just on the sort of whim that you do invest in some of the Magnificent Seven stocks, which ones do you think are going to be the winners? Which do you think are going to be losers? Well, you know, we're partial, just given our background, to some of the ones that look more like media companies, the ones that have been eating advertising, in fact, eating the whole advertising pie. You know, those have been Google and, and Meta in particular. And you think Meta still has some, uh, some room to run. It's not expensive. Um, met, uh, Zuckerberg has, has shown some cost discipline, which I think will continue, and, and they continue to take share in advertising. Chris, 194% gain year to date last year. If you weren't in that name, you were in that name, Chris. If you weren't in that name, would you suggest that people add fresh capital to it, given the move we've seen in the last 12 months? 
Yeah, listen, I think uh, the market doesn't know how much it was up. The stock doesn't know how much it was up last year. Uh, and um, just looks at what the earnings are going forward. And the, you know, over $20 a share, it's, it's not an expensive stock. TK, Meta up 194%. NVIDIA, number one on the S&P 500 last year, up 238.87%. Yeah, a, a nice lineup. And what's important here to Mr. Marenghi and Mr. Gabelli's effort is you got to have a three, five, ten-year perspective. Which of those tech superstars, John, do you have courage to own out five years or seven years or ten years? I don't hear enough talk about that. In what the you heard from Chris press. there, I think, is really important, though, Tom. <clears throat> the stock market doesn't have a memory. That individual stock doesn't have. Yeah, what, a what, what I notice here with Moringi, at least I think this is important. He goes right to the glazed donut. I mean, that's what he's doing. He's got bell ring, 420 employees in St. Louis, BRBR. Oh, you've done your research. And they got to deal with the Dunkin' Donuts where they're putting a hydrolyzed whey protein isolate on a Dunkin'. On glazed donut. donut. That's why Mario Gabelli well, went into this is because it's donuts. Okay, you know what? Let's go there. And just, I would love a final word from Chris on Ozempic. Is he worried about Ozempic yeah. with that glazed donut? Chris, is that something that you're really thinking about? Well, that's why we love BRBR. Uh, it's, it actually is on trend. You need protein support if you're on the, uh, any of these drugs. And um, so they're a beneficiary of actually the semaglutides. Chris Maranke, thank oh, you for making that great. work. Appreciate it, Chris. It's going to catch up as always. Happy New Year, sir. Chris Maranke there <coughs> of Gabelli Funds. Here's the banner headline. Mario Gabelli on trend with glazed donuts from Duck and Donuts with a Zempic going on. I feel like I'm you, Tom. I feel like I want to bite my tongue so oh, hard. So How many times? Mic. Basically, they're sort of dressed <laughs> up candy bars. Well, there's these dressed up candy bars. They've got a little whey protein in them, and they're called a health shake or a health bar. <laughs> I mean, this is the same <laughs> thing. That's how it works. I mean, that's exactly how it works. And it's chocolate coated, and it's got, you know, Splenda in there, so it doesn't have as much sugar. But essentially, for all intents and purposes. I, I walked by a Krispy Kreme <laughs> on our sojourn. Oh, tell us we more. Were, well, we were going to, you know, should I go in and buy a dozen for the team? And, he will. You know, and did you say that? It was unhealthy. It would be sending a bad signal. Okay. It was well, that's one company. Let's talk about the correct. others. We've mentioned big tech. And I went through NVIDIA, number one performer on the S&P last year. Number two was Meta. Royal Caribbean, number three. Number three, Tom. That was a bounce. Up 162%. Yeah. Carnival in the mix as well. Number I, six stock up 130 on the year. You bring up a really important point, folks. And this dovetails into the economic data we're going to see this week is some of these things are off the bottom, like maybe cruise ships off COVID. Maybe China's on the bottom right now. That's a huge unknown. But these others are growing companies. And we can argue about the valuation model. We'll talk about that through the three hours today. But the answer is there's two discussions here. Growing companies, well, how do you price them? And off the mat last year, how do you come off the mat of 2000? 23. It's not doesn't exist. And ultimately, Tom, the question on leadership, where that leadership is going to come from in 2024. And Lisa, towards the end of the year, I think a lot of people, once again, for maybe the second or third time in 2023, got bulled up on the idea that discretionary can continue this performance into 2024. The likes of Neil Dutta, Renaissance Macro, who's really putting out there that he thinks that this resilience, this economic expansion can continue <coughs> because real wage growth is going to remain decent through the year ahead. And ultimately, that's going to support this discretionary yeah. thing. If that is supported, <coughs> then shouldn't the gains be a lot more than 6 to 9% on the S&P 500? If that's the case, don't you see big tech hanging in there, not necessarily declining, and everything else well, they, catching well, up? It, and this, to me, is sort of the big sort of unknown. If the consensus right. is always wrong, the consensus calls for some sort of medium performance. So where is the outperformance okay. or underperformance But what's the efficacy from? of watching Bloomberg surveillance? Here's the answer. John Farrell puts out J.P. Morgan, 4,200. Oppenheimer, 5,200. So there's a thousand point, point difference at Standard & Poor's 500. I, you know, I can't even do the math. It's 20% variance or whatever. This is all BS. I mean, that's all there is to it. And the answer is you take this to find your confidence if you're in the market. You What's know? the efficacy of surveillance? And then that it's final obvious. phrase. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a good start to the year. You, this, why are you watching this? You're watching this because we'll give you a perspective. Now. A big question, TK. <laughs> <laughs> From New York City this morning, good morning. Coming up a little bit later, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods and the big bull on Wall Street, John Stolfers of Oppenheimer, about two hours away. From New York, good morning.
one, just to reiterate what I said before, we're gonna do what we have to do to protect shipping. Number two, we've got significant national security interests in the region just on our own, the United States. And we're gonna put the kind of forces we need in the region to protect those interests, and we're going to act in self-defense going forward. Again, I'm not ruling anything in or out, uh, but we have made it clear publicly to the Houthis, we've made it clear privately to our allies and partners in the region that we take these threats seriously, uh, and we're gonna make the right decisions going forward. Things looking increasingly fragile in the Middle East. That was John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson, speaking on ABC over the weekend. Live from New York City this morning, good morning and happy new year to our audience worldwide. Let's check in on the price action to kick off 2024. Equity futures pulling back by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Just a little bit lighter, softer, negative, lower. Off the back of this maybe, check out Apple in the pre-market. Down off the back of this move. <coughs> From Barclays and Tim Long, Lisa, we're lowering our rating from equal weight to underweight. We believe the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. That stock is down 1.6%. And they're not alone. And this to me was something that I found interesting over the past week of reading. Michael Batnick over at Ritholtz Wealth Management put out projections that he admitted probably were fantasy just given the fact that all projections are to Tom's point earlier. But he said Apple the business didn't have a great year. In the last 12 months revenue is down, expenses are up and operating income is down. This raising a question, does it have the growth of the other Magnificent Seven and does it belong there? It was true all year. And we ask that question every month, every quarter, and stock it ended. Tom, it ended the year up well, by 48% a year today. I'm going to save the multiple. Save the multiple expansion for later. But right now, I got a 29 multiple. Excuse me, a 31 multiple. And on their massive growth, subpar compared to others, it's a 29 multiple stock. And so you say to yourself, where's the growthiness of these research notes? The concern at Barclays, and the answer is they're not running this for growth. They're running it for profit. It's a profit juggernaut, and use of cash is everything at Apple. To your point, still a monster cash machine, Tom. It, Spitting off no billions and billions of cash, yeah. which is going back into big buybacks and shareholder rewards. Yeah. I mean, I, I just can't say enough about how the, the Magnificent Seven, John, aren't just seven uh, as they are. We're going to move forward here now, and of course we look forward to the politics of the one again futures down 22, the VIX 13.68. Jennifer Flitton is head of U.S. government affairs at Invesco and joins us on the 14 things that we need to focus on. Jennifer, I'm going to talk about something that I was shocked didn't come up this weekend. It's a calendar item. It's January. And January means you're going to be in your L.L. Bean boots in Concord, New Hampshire, watching the show go by. Does New Hampshire this year matter? Absolutely, New Hampshire matters. I mean, this is the first primary in the nation. Uh, it is um, uh, right after, uh, seven days after the Iowa caucus. And quite frankly, the best uh, chance for Nikki Haley to really um, take hold in this race is in New Hampshire. And if she can't, you know, this may be locked up rather early this year for Donald Trump. The up four days ago, of Ms. Haley and the idea of slavery, misstatements, incorrect, whatever the, the debate was, will that affect her in New Hampshire? Well, I think it remains to be seen. I think Chris Christie is certainly trying to um, take advantage of, of that misstatement that she made a few days back. Uh, you've seen her try to um, uh, change the news cycle, but I think we're on like the fifth or seventh cycle here and it, it isn't, um, she's not shaking it. Well, given the fact, Jennifer, that Donald Trump likely is the Republican nominee and pretty much all the polls are pointing in that direction, how will he really influence some of the key debates that really are going to happen way before the election, including in 17 days time where we could get another, uh, get another government shutdown? Yeah, that's excellent point. And, and that's what we're really watching here. And it, it is the government uh, potential partial government shutdown here on January 19th. And then uh, another uh, uh, risk then on uh, February 2nd. But there's also this defense supplemental. And so his uh, reading of whatever sort of negotiated package comes out in the next week or so on immigration, Ukraine, Israel, Indo-Pacific, uh, and border policy, that could sink or allow for uh, this defense supplemental to, to actually take hold and pass through Congress and signed by the president. So 
Um, I, I think we're watching his reaction rather closely to whatever comes out when Congress comes back next week. Which really raises this question about whether there is more urgency around providing aid to both Ukraine, given the offensive that we've seen, the aerial offensive from Russia, as well as from Israel, uh, especially given some of the Houthi attacks and the recent Iranian warship. Do you expect the attitude in Washington to have shifted about really voting for aid in a much more significant way? Look, I mean, Ukraine aid is completely tied to border policy, and, and that is only uh, getting uh, more tense uh, due to the fact that we have close to 300,000 people who have now come over the border just in step December 1st. Um, we're, we're breaking uh, you know, new ground here. And so the reaction, and we saw it on the Sunday morning shows from Senator Graham uh, and from Mike Rogers, those who really would like to see Ukraine aid happen, and they want that support from the Republicans uh, in their conference, they know it has to happen alongside strong border policy shifts. And so we're still waiting to see what it is that they right. come up with. They're still drafting that language. Well, Civics 101, I mean, we're talking about a lot of Republicans here. Does does the, does the administration have a border policy after the cacophony of news the last 10 days? Well, I think they have a border crisis. And I think there's an acknowledgement, uh, especially among uh, Democrats who are in difficult districts. You know, you have in the House specifically, you have 24 roughly toss up districts. And number of those uh, Democrats who are in those tough races are really looking for a resolution here. And you see this, uh, especially down in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, there has to be some sort of um, uh, dealing with this issue and, and not just for House members, but also for Senate, um, uh, you know, these toss up Senate races in Arizona and Ohio, uh, Montana, you know, they need resolution here. And it's going to have to be part of this defense supplemental. TK, the optics for the White House over the last week or so, just absolutely terrible. The president's on the beach at the <clears> same time, U.S. border officials are processing more than 300,000 migrants for the month of December, potentially the highest monthly tally on record. It's, it's, it's extraordinary and to follow this across the life of Bloomberg surveillance. It's an intractable issue that everyone wants to dodge. For us in New York City folks, it's visceral. I think the latest thing I saw within the zeitgeist is the buses from Texas are now being dropped off in New Jersey because the mayor and others in New York City have said, no, you're not going to drop them off in New York State. What do those good people do in New Jersey? That's the immediate question. Hey, Jennifer, just to squeeze in an additional question, if we can, on that point, how does the president between now and early November convince the electorate this is something that he can do something about? Well, and that's why the next several days really matter. So if it's not tied to defense supplemental, uh, then it's going to have to be tied somehow to appropriations. Um, you're you're going to see this pressure rise when Congress comes back uh, next week. It's not going anywhere. And there has to be some sort of resolution for this administration going into what may be an early start to a general election. They've got a lot of work to do down in Washington, D.C. Jennifer Flidden there of Invesco. Jennifer, thank you. Lisa, we've got these two deadlines coming up for spending, potentially talking about government shutdowns, never mind the election out there in November. It's going to be messy. It's going to be really messy because it doesn't seem like there's any resolution. And frankly, there's been discussion from uh, Mike Johnson, the House Speaker, that they're going to be separate bills for each one of the spending packages. They don't have time to get no. past something like 17 independent bills. I, I suggest it will be October of next year a focal debate and it will go right into the presidential election that we'll see in November. Well, Those two Cameron. deadlines we're all looking for. January 19th is one, February 2nd yeah. is the other. Coming up shortly on the outlook for the economy in America, Bruce Kasman at JP Morgan. That conversation just around the corner from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York, here are the scores on the S&P 500, kicking off 2024, pulling back just a touch on the S&P. We're negative here by 0.5%. Lighter on the NASDAQ, taking things down by about 0.85%. Lisa, the majority of this, would you say, down to that downgrade from Barclays on Apple? Apple down this morning in the pre-market. 
Especially because it really comes after uh, so many people have pointed to Apple as a potential outlier of the Magnificent Seven, not delivering the same kind of sales growth. Those shares down 1.9% in pre-market oh. trading. So yes, given the weight of them, this one stock can bring everything down, just reminding us how important it is to get the Magnificent Seven right. I would say there's a, a set of opinions on Apple. Let's go to Four Trillion Man. Uh, Dan Ives at Wedbush uh, models out. Three trillion to four trillion in market cap out 18 months. He doesn't really put a timeline on it, but this is the bet on these stocks, whether you're pro or con, is it's more about the business strategy, the structure of it, and it is about gaming stock price. As Lisa mentioned, we're down almost 2% in the pre-market. Let's turn from stocks to bonds. In equity land, nine-week winning streak on the S&P 500. In the bond market, November, the 10-year yield down 60 basis points. December, the 10-year yield down almost 45 basis points. This morning in January, Lisa, up five or six basis points, back to 393.50. Basically where we started last year. Again, this is sort of, to your point, trolling us because we see this wild shift up to 5%, wild shift down to sub 4%, and we're just bang, we're back where we were before. Right now, it's very unclear to me whether people are going to get worried yet again right. about inflation when you start to see a well, labor market hang in there in an economy that's okay. But the micro trends that there, the United Kingdom, John, you know this, 7.7%. I mean, Grizzly, I mean, Grizzly going to lower their prices. 7.7% down to 6.7% on food prices. Uh, that from Katie Linsel in uh, Queen Victoria Street. And the answer is there's Spain, there's London, there's Germany, there's the U.S. There are these microdatas of disinflation, including the deflationary impulse of China, which gets you to the enthusiasm. Let's turn to foreign exchange, Tom. Push out some of those bond markets through foreign exchange. Those yeah. big moves in bonds taking down the US dollar. The first down <coughs> year for the dollar index since 2020, the euro threw 110 briefly. Lisa, back down to 109.79. But if you look at some of the ranges, some of the levels we've gone through, think about the move we've seen in the Swiss franc as well. The recent weakness in the dollar and the strength elsewhere has been pretty notable in the last month. And it's all really stemming from this idea that the Fed is going to cut rates more than three times, maybe five or six times this year. Why? If there isn't true weakness in the economy, can they do that? And we're going to have to talk about that, even though people are sick of that conversation. It will still dominate things in 2024. Can't wait for the Fed minutes a little bit later this week. <laughs> a lot of people. Did they talk about it? Are they actively talking about it? TK might Several. read them as well. What time are they tomorrow? I think they're at 2 p.m. Oh. Cannot wait. Okay. Good start to 2024. Under Savannah's this morning, crude gaining as Iran ramps up tensions in the Red Sea. Tehran sending a warship to the area after the U.S. Navy destroyed three Houthi boats over the weekend. Mask also suspending all Red Sea transit in order to assess the situation. This one has been simmering now for the last two months, last two, three months now, Lisa, and starting to get to boiling point more recently. Well, especially the fact that Iran is going to directly bring their own resources into the region. This is sort of getting closer to... Honestly, what we've been hearing from Mitch McConnell and others, the direct confrontation between the U.S. and Iran and what really will trigger that if you have both U.S. warships, Iranian warships, right. the Houthi militants and the U.S. willing to shoot them down. You know, Elliot Ackerman scheduled to be with us here with a wonderful book, 2034, and that's all about unintended consequences. And this is how you do it. You've got things in a sea contained like the Red Sea. And, you know, they got the best of plans, the best of hopes. And then there's oops, and that's the risk that's out there right now is one oops, two oops, or sequential mistakes being made. Deeply upsetting images coming out of the region in the last three months or so, the last two, three months. Shocking images coming out of Japan over the last 24 hours, including these. A Japanese Coast Guard plane colliding with a Japan Airlines flight at Haneda Airport in Tokyo. All 379 passengers and crew on board. The larger plane safely evacuated, according to a spokesperson, but five of the six crew on the Coast Guard plane are unaccounted for, Lee. So the smaller plane was carrying aid to northern Japan, where its 7.6 magnitude tremor hit the country. At least 48 people have died. We understand from the latest reporting coming out of Japan that five are confirmed dead in that Japan Coast Guard plane collision. That news just coming through moments ago. And it's just horrible, uh, considering the fact that they're also reeling from what we saw with the earthquake, whether this was related or not. Very unclear about what some of the details were in this, but there's a real question here about how this country is going to uh, really evolve. You're seeing the yen respond in early morning to the disasters. I bring it across the world here. We're off of COVID and off of the challenges of a American transportation system. There's a real worry, John. It's unspoken, sometimes reported on. People are worried about order at different airports. You know, in New York, we're focused on this, but 
I, I, this is not just a Japanese issue. Let's say developing story in the last 24 hours, particularly that crash in the last couple of hours. Any more on that? We'll bring those details to you. I wanted to finish on this. Dutch manufacturer ASML bowing to pressure from the Biden administration. According to Bloomberg, the company cancelled shipments of its shipmaking equipment to China weeks before export bans came into effect for January. The Biden administration is cracking down China's efforts to make advanced semiconductors and lease the progress in AI. And this, to me, uh, comes as the ASML CEO talked last year about how they're going to lose some 15% of their revenue uh, from China as a result of some of these bans, yet still going ahead with this because it's not just the United States. It's also European countries trying to restrict China's ability to develop some of the chips and the iPhone rival and other things that they're developing. This, to me, is really the key area to watch, especially as you hear Xi Jinping with some niceties <laughs> where you're memorializing uh, the, the ties between the U.S. and China that were initiated mm. in 1979 mm. and Biden trying to make nice noise. This well, is what you need to be watching. But it's the mystery. I, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I would say China is a simple mystery for this year. Was it going to do 5% GDP and also, of course, all the uh, politics as well? Let's turn to that. Some of the mysteries of your 2024. Bruce Kasman Brees, Chief Economist, JP Morgan. Bruce, thank you so much for starting our year um, strong. I'm going to cut to the chase. There's an enthusiasm out there. Tony Dwyer over at Canaccord Genuity just says investors are giddy. I mean, there's just no other way to put it after what we've seen in Q4. Do we have the animal spirit, the nominal GDP, to sustain our collective giddy? Well, I think on the one hand, there is a um, support for growth here that's already reflected in the health of what is both the private sector on the household and the business sector uh, side that should continue to keep growth going. And now we've got an additional push coming from financial market easing. So I think the prospects for growth here, while not boomy, look reasonably good. The question is whether the enthusiasm, which is being driven in large part by expectations of substantial Fed easing in the first half of the year, is going to be realized. And here we think there's probably going to be a bit of a, a speed bump that comes in the way, right. because I don't think inflation will keep coming down in a way that will deliver that outcome. Well, to the speed bump, you've provided this. As you well know, Michael Feroli's on the short list to be the next Fed governor. But the answer is Feroli of J.P. Morgan has a potential GDP of sub 2%. John Williams has an R star that's back down to what it used to be pre-COVID. Should we just understand we're going to migrate at some point back to the Feroli lower levels of real GDP? Well, I think it's it's pretty unclear right now, given how much the shocks uh, from the pandemic have kind of affected things. I mean, my own view is that our star is higher. I think it's shown in how the economy has performed over the last year or two. I don't want to argue that's a long term uh, estimate, uh, but I think the economy is in, in a healthy position here. I think it will take higher rates to be sustained here to continue to bring inflation down. Inflation is not going to stay high as it was over the last two years. But I think getting down from three to two is probably going to take more work. And I think it's not going to happen quickly. And as a result of that, I do think the Fed is probably going to be disappointing here relative to the speed at which rate cuts are priced into the market. Bruce, as you know, as we all know, the last 12 months marked by recession calls that never really materialized. What have we learned in the last 12 months about which data points are relevant and which data points are totally irrelevant because I'm looking at a manufacturing ISM that comes out later this week which has been sub 50 since November 2022 how useful is that well I think what we've we've learned or should have learned here first of all that forecasting is hard and that's something we should always be reminded of but I think importantly in this environment we should learn that there's a whole set of things happening in this pandemic recovery which are unusual you know, 500 basis points of Fed tightening traditionally deliver a recession, and that's what a lot of people were basing forecasts on. But as you noted, even as manufacturing globally has been soft, the service sector has been lifting as a result of pandemic normalization. In the U.S., you've had a big fiscal impulse, which I think people missed last year. And more generally, the underlying health of the household and business sector, I think, is something that's not usually in place when the Fed is tightening a lot and has provided a real backdrop of resiliency. Uh, resiliency has been the theme, not strength so much. And I think it's still in place here. And I don't think we should bet against uh, the U.S. or global economy 
at least not over the next six months or so. To build on John's question about which data points matter, I do wonder about the stacking of all of the employment metrics that we're going to get this week, uh, uh, really uh, topped off with that non-farm payrolls report. How high is the bar for either wages to increase, for the numbers to stay high, for the market to wake up to the realization that you're talking about, that frankly, the Fed cannot cut rates six times this year, and that the economy is much stronger and inflation, unfortunately, a bit stickier? So I'd say first off that the, you know, the payroll report, the data we're going to get this week are going to speak much more to growth, even though we have an average hourly earnings report, which will speak directly to, to wage inflation. We are looking for a four-tenths gain on that. Um, but I think the message from this week is that the economy is doing reasonably well, not as strong as it was six or nine months ago. Uh, we're looking for job growth to be settling here somewhere in the 150, 175 a thousand a month range here. And I think what you want to look here is at the pattern of behavior. As you noted, manufacturing still looks weak, but there still is broader strength in the economy outside of manufacturing. And I think the net effect of this is an economy that's growing probably around 2% right now. So this leads to this question of the round trip that we've seen on the 10-year yield. Are we currently seeing restricted levels of rates? Are we going to see that working their way through the economy this year? Or is this really going to be something that allows the recovery or the expansion to continue? Well, that's an interesting question, because as you know, the Fed responded to the rise in tenure yields uh, from the middle of the year through the end of September by arguing that that was doing some of its work for it. It has not pushed back against the easing so far. It's really embraced the idea that we can get inflation down without having to have any pain and possibly have material Fed easing. Uh, we do see the fall in 10-year yields as a reflection of risk appetite going up. You see that more broadly in equity markets. You see it across mm -hmm. risky assets around the world. I think it will support growth. It does promote resiliency. And I think it is going to, on the margin, be a right. factor that's going to slow the Fed and other central banks down here. Continuing my rudeness into 2024, uh, Bruce, just too short an answer necessary. With you and Joyce Chang and your work at J.P. Morgan, what will be the GDP outcome of China this year? I think five is as good enough a number. Uh, China is an economy which is moving in different directions and different pieces. But I think there's enough policy support. I think the external uh, recovery we see, which is quite modest, but taking hold in tech and, and manufacturing will help it. I think it'll grow five with a very weak private sector uh, demand and quite significant supports externally and from the public sector. They're following a pretty shaky year as well. Bruce, thank you, sir, for catching up with us this morning. Appreciate the update. Happy New Year, Bruce. Bruce Kassman there of JP Morgan. I did <coughs> promise you an update on the latest out of Japan following that airline collision at Haneda Airport in Tokyo. A Japanese Coast Guard plane colliding with a Japan Airlines flight at that particular airport. As far as we understand, all 379 passengers and crew on board the larger plane safely evacuated, according to a spokesperson. The latest we're getting on the smaller Coast Guard plane, Elisa, five Coast Guard members confirmed dead. This according to the Japan land minister. And we will be obviously getting more details as it comes in, but really uh, just yet another tragedy on top of the already tragic images from the earthquake that we saw, as well as some of the tsunami fears uh, this coming, yeah. as we still try to establish what actually happened here. To the two airports of Tokyo, we all know Narita and the horrific drive. It's 40 miles from Narita. It makes O'Hare look like a walk in the park. Haneda is, is a newer airport, if you will, for commercial aircraft, mostly domestic mostly northern Asia, less the international flights. That's the latest out of Japan. More on that a little bit later when we get more updates for you. For the broader price action, we look like this on the S&P 500, pulling back by 0.7% on the S&P. An update on Apple, a downgrade from Barclays this morning. That stock is negative by about 1.8%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Be a temptation to think that the, uh, the the three major conflict areas geopolitically that you just pointed out, uh, Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, uh, are, are going to be somehow handled uh, when in fact they're going to continue on for months. I mean, there's no easy end to the Ukraine war. Uh, the Israelis say that the Hamas war will go on for months, uh, and I don't see anything there to stop it. And there's a lot of volatility around Taiwan, which I think, frankly, is under underappreciated uh, uh, by markets.
That was Terry Haynes there, the founder of Pangaea Policy. As geopolitical tensions mount and linger, the latest from Iran dispatching a warship to the Red Sea. More on that in just a moment. The broader price action, if you're picking up on things and commodities, crude looks like this on WTI 73.20, up by about 2.2%. Brent crude up to almost 79, at least. So 78.71, up there by a little more than 2%. To me, I'm watching this very closely. We've been surprised all year by oil prices declining and actually ending the year with a loss last year. This year, really key to see as Iran sends a ship over to the region we're not seeing any sort of quieting down in some of the conflict in the Red Sea. You heard it there from Terry Haynes. Underappreciated by markets, maybe. Tom, October crude was down 10.76%. November, it was down 6%. December, it was down 5.67%. They're the last three months on crude, even with all of this yeah. going on in the Middle East. With all this going on in the Middle East, and it's 78.68 on Brent crude, up 2.1%. It's sort of middle tendency. I thought I'd see a bigger move over the last week. But the answer is, you know, people are using surge or lifted. Well, it's just trading up. And I would thought, I think it'd be much higher. Is it possible that the United States is the number one producer of hydrocarbons in the world? It is, is the weight of US output, 13 million barrels it? a day of output in this country. It certainly contributes to that move, Tom. Joe Biden, Secretary Granholm, oil czars, if you will. Yeah, except they won't talk about it. They won't talk about it. <laughs> they TK. certainly won't talk they about it to me. Oh, it. an inside surveillance joke. Right now, we need perspective, and we get it from someone gifted. He's served the nation in the Marine Corps, uh, also a White House fellow. And critically, he is the king of speculative fiction with James Stravitas. Elliot Ackerman's must read 2034. Boy, is that a must read right now, given the Philippines, given the South China Sea. And we eagerly anticipate 2054 that you'll see in March. Elliot Ackerman joins us this morning. Elliot, this is not speculative fiction. It is reality in the Red Sea. What is lost in the press coverage? Yeah, I think the one thing um, that is often lost is we have a tendency to focus kind of specifically on military events while losing perspective that all military events happen in a political overlay. You know, ultimately, these are political questions. What's going on in Taiwan? What's going on in Ukraine? What's going on in Israel? And the longer these wars play out, the more and more central the politics of the war itself become and what the outcome is going to be. The heart of your fiction with Admiral Stravitas is things happen suddenly and then in sequence. Do we have the ships in place? against these terrorists, whatever you want to call them. Do we have the process in place where unexpected bad things can happen in sequence? I think when it comes to, uh, to the Middle East and the challenges that we're seeing there, yes, we do. And, uh, and that is a situation where we, you know, we the United States, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Iranians, we are not facing a peer-level adversary necessarily in Iran. Uh, and I agree with Terry's comments that the underappreciated conflict here is Taiwan. And when it comes to Taiwan, you know, the United States does not have the forces in place, uh, at least peer level forces in place that could meet Chinese aggression across the Taiwan Straits. And that's a, one of the huge challenges that we face is that the Chinese would be fighting that conflict in their backyard and we would be fighting it from across the Pacific Ocean. I want you to elaborate a little bit on the point that you just made, that all of these international conflicts have real domestic political implications. What are some of the ramifications that we've seen over the past year, how the conflicts have developed and how public opinion has shaped the inaction that we're currently seeing in Congress to continue providing aid? I think when we go around the go around the world, if we look at Ukraine right now, um, I would argue that that's probably a war that's not going to be decided on the battlefield as those conditions stagnate. It is a war that's going to be decided at the ballot box. And I think in Ukraine, in Israel, as we see this war is now extending into months, I think domestic political considerations in Israel are going to determine the outcome of their war with Hamas. Um, and I think when we look at the United States, you know, the elephant in the room is we have an election that's going to occur this fall. And how that election unfolds will be determinative to those conflicts. And lastly, when we look at Taiwan, I mean, in, in two weeks, the Taiwanese people are having a presidential election. And the outcome of that election will certainly affect China's perceptions on what they should do in Taiwan. How different is the foreign policy of Donald Trump versus uh, President Biden? I think the foreign policy of Donald Trump is much more unpredictable 
Uh, and I think the, the foreign policy of Joe Biden, as we've seen it, is much more and has a much more incremental. Um, so I don't think anyone can necessarily say what Donald Trump's policies would be on any three of these conflicts, Taiwan, Ukraine or Israel, whereas I think we've seen sort of a more consistent approach that Joe Biden uh, has applied. I, I mean, I look, Elliot, at where we are and it's about public service. There's a lot of people watching this across this nation that have loved ones at sea, loved ones on long tours of duty. I know that the Ford is coming back from the Mediterranean. Are we fit now in our defense budget for multiple wars? You mentioned Taiwan. Let's take our war Ukraine, our war Iran, maybe our war China. Do we have a budget near capable of meeting those three threats? I think, we're t I think we have to take a very, very hard look, not only at, at the budget and the financial resources that we're applying, but you know, also the intellectual resources. And that's actually where I have the most concerns. You know, is a, would a war against China look like a repeat of the Second World War in which the coin of the realm and naval battle were aircraft carriers uh, 80 years after the aircraft carrier became the coin of the realm? And I don't know that that's necessarily the case. You know, we've seen in places like Ukraine that the Ukrainians have been very effective in sinking Russian ships of the line with shore based missiles. And so um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a Marine veteran. My own service right now is in the midst of doing some real strategic, a real strategic reset about what it would look like to fight a revisited island hopping campaign in the South China Sea. And they're restructuring the entire Marine Corps to do that. So I think there's there's a budgetary question, but there's also uh, an intellectual question of, you know, what will the wars of the future look like? And that that work needs to be done now. And it's going to force some American military institutions to, to transform in ways that are going to be very uncomfortable. With the war of the future, Elliot, what's a more effective strategy, one that's predictable or one that's unpredictable? Well, I think in terms of your battle plans, you always want to be unpredictable. Um, the word I would use is one that is adaptive. Um, because it's very difficult to predict what the war of the future is going to be. It's most essential not to get the prediction right, but to get the posture right so that your forces can adapt to whatever the next conflict looks like. And you know, to use an analogy from the Second World War, at the outset of the Second World War, in terms of naval warfare, again, the coin of the realm was the battleship. Uh, and it had been the coin of the realm, the most essential platform for, for centuries. Um, but as we all know, you know, Pearl Harbor, the entire U.S. battleship fleet was sunk. And we had this new platform, which is the aircraft carrier. And that, that platform was able to adapt and become the central force around which naval battles were fought. And I think whatever the next war is, we're going to see a similar process of adaptation need to occur. It's going to have to occur very fast. And the side that gets it right will probably be the side that wins. Elliot, just to finish there, what do you suspect it is? Um, I think it's going to probably be a network of platforms. Uh, I think it's going to be... Uh, Unmanned, unmanned ships, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, our ability to fight both a high-tech war uh, and also a hybrid low-tech war when many of those high-tech systems are taken offline and our forces' ability to kind of toggle between the two. Um, so it's going to be very, very complex, um, but more of the uh, a network-centric version of warfare as opposed to a platform-centric version of warfare built around, you know, very big ships and aircraft and things of that nature. Interesting. Interesting. Elliot, thank you. Appreciate your time this morning. Always do. Happy New Year, sir. Thank you. Elliot Ackerman there. Happy New Year. U.S. Marine Corps veteran on the latest TK. I can't say enough about his book, 2034. When the kids say to me, what book do I want to read? But I don't want to read 1,200 pages of Jonathan Spence. I say, shut up and read Stravitas and Ackerman. Ackerman and Stravitas. It'll be a great movie on Netflix. Well, this is the reason why I'm watching ASML and some of the bans on certain technology to China. Because what Elliot Ackerman is talking about is going to be fueled by a lot of these technologies that are connected to chips and artificial intelligence and unmanned kinds of high-level, not thinking, but processing of data points. And we're on totally the same page. The difference between rhetoric and policy. The rhetoric is cozy, a little bit better between China and the United States, but the policy, the policy's not changing anytime soon. Coming up, Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Woods on this equity market. Pulling back just a touch. We're down 0.6% on the S&P. The S&P 500 coming into a new year on a nine-week winning streak. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
2024 is going to be the year that we have a very serious discussion in the financial markets about the Federal Reserve's credibility. What I'm excited about in 2024 is to not hang on every single word that the Fed is saying. Paul thinks the Fed's going to be cutting rates in 2024. But it's possible that the economy could be firmer for longer. If our call is right, more likely to have a soft landing than a recession, clearly not cutting in March of 2024. The Fed is really unlikely to start cutting in March. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market this morning pulling back by 0.6% on the S&P 500. Before we get all excited and start talking about 2024, let's talk about 2023. Coming into a brand new year, the average forecast 4,000 points on the S&P 500. We close almost 20% higher. So let's talk about, Tom, 2024. The moves for the year ahead. Well, the conviction that, yeah. on Wall Street, the high 5,200, the low 4,200, a 1,000 point spread yeah. between Oppenheimer at the high end and JP Morgan at the low end. John Stolfos of Opco there. Sam Stovall also from CFRA who had a, a really interesting and wonderful 2023 of optimism as well. And you say, well, how did this happen? And here's the solution. There's a thing called valuation expansion. Uh, Stuart Kaiser at Citigroup with a great research note here on the valuation expansion, the PE multiple expansion that we all witnessed. John, I would suggest 12 months ago that was not predicted. And yet there it is. Look at Apple with a 31 PE. This sets up Apple perfectly. Perfectly, Tom, in the pre-market pulling back. The early call to start a brand new year coming oh. from the team over at Barclays and Tim Long. Lowering our rating from equal weight to underweight. The 15 has been lacklustre. We believe the 16 should be the same. We believe, Lisa, the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. In the last 12 months, you've had revenue down. You've had expenses up. You've had operating income down. You've got this question of just how much is the cash flow fueling some of the gains by pouring them back into stock purchases and how long can they continue doing that and be continued to grow stock. At this point, this to me, how did we get it so wrong? Magnificent right. Seven were up 107% last year. This year people are saying all the others will come to the bat. Okay, this is still the mystery at a time where we're not getting real growth in one of the biggest names. Yeah, but I'm going to go to the optimism side, and that is, let's, I mean, there's a lot in common between the great Sir John Templeton and Dan Ives. They both were uh, great Air Jordans, and the answer is Dan Ives is channeling Sir John Templeton this morning. Apple shares, they're on sale. That's what on John sale. Templeton, okay. that's the language of okay. the wonderful John Templeton of Tennessee. Yeah, it's Dan Ives saying on sale, just to be very clear. Uh, he's saying, uh, Dan Ives is saying at Wedbush on sale, he's okay. modeling out a four trillion dollar apple out there somewhere and this is the struggle the pain of not holding apple everything that Barclays said this morning is true almost 99 percent of it is true and it was true through much of the whole of last year Lisa and yet still that stock closed the year higher by almost 50 percent and the bull case includes services the bull case includes uh, just ongoing uh, recycling and ongoing re-upgrading uh, considering the fact that the upgrade right. cycle was delayed not deferred completely there is a question here about how any of the tech stocks are going to perform because when we headed into the beginning of last year frankly everyone was saying this is going to be the area of underperformance finally they were so wrong so we're so wrong again whatever the consensus is number one thing i missed Zuckerberg. I miss Meta, Meta yeah, big Zuckerberg. Move. He's cut and chiseled like you, John. I, I, I just, I missed Zuckerberg in 2023. It's the first comparison I've ever had with <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, TK. We'll leave Thank that you. one there. Thank you. I think we're all eating humble pie on yeah. Wall Street after the year we've just had on the S&P 500 and the year we've just had elsewhere, by the way, in the bond market, just narrative after narrative and the 10-year yield just laughing in everybody's faces and closing the year exactly where it started it. Here's the price action for you this morning, a 10-year at 395 57. Yields up this morning by seven or eight basis points. Equities pulling back a touch here, Lisa. We're down 0.6% on the S&P. Yeah, and how much does higher oil prices uh, really kind of fuel this idea of potential inflation reigniting? This is what we're watching for the week ahead. ISM Manufacturing comes out tomorrow as well as the FOMC meeting minutes around 2 p.m. At 10 a.m. we get the Jolt's job openings, which have been coming down. 
Again, a fuzzy number, unclear exactly how predictive this is. But if you see the unemployment rate remain low and job openings come down, this fuels the immaculate disinflation discussion. Thursday, we get initial jobless claims. Those have been increasing. I am curious about continuing claims, considering the fact that, you know, there is this feeling something has to give on the labor market front for inflation to come down and non-farm payrolls to finish the labor market theme uh, comes out on Friday along with ISM services. Do we see average hourly earnings sticky at around 4% year over year. If they are, can we see a Fed truly cut interest rates by six times, by 150 basis points throughout the remainder of 2024? We're hitting the ground running in the first week of 2024. With us around the table, Sarah Hunt, Chief Market Strategist at Alpine Saxon Woods. Sarah, good morning and Happy New Year. Let's revisit that quote from Barclays this morning. We believe the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. Are you on the same page? I think you almost have to be. I mean, you know, the, the, the theme for 2023 was all about the Fed and what was going to happen. And as soon as the cycle peaked, you could be OK. So if we pulled forward a lot of multiple expansion on the back of the idea that rates are going to come down, they're probably not going to come down to that great financial crisis level. If they come down a couple hundred basis points, is the multiple expansion already too much? And I think that that's going to be the big tension in a lot of them. And, you know, for Apple, which we were talking about, you've got to look at all that consistency and all that cash flow. And that's what people are paying for, that and the exclusivity of its Apple and people will keep replacing those products. Is that assessment true of the whole market of just a select group? of stocks I, that dominate the market. I think it's more a select group. I mean, you have to, I think valuations, and we keep saying, you know, it's almost like this is Europe's year. This is valuations year. It's going to matter this year, right? I don't know when it's going to matter, but at some point it will. I think having money have a cost makes valuations matter in a way that we had 15 years where, you know, people talked about it, but it didn't really matter. Maybe that starts to happen now, and maybe people really start looking at those metrics. But I think you've got a lot of money on the table, and you've got a lot of places that, you know, got a lot of money that needs to be invested. Frame out total return. You can go to the Bloomberg folks, the terminal, TRA is the function, and you can model in annual return quickly, one year back, two years back, three years, et cetera. And the answer is, we're now addicted to, oh, I made 15%, I failed. Baloney. It's a single digit return. At the most, you're going to make 11%. But the answer is, do we need to get used again to equity return of 8 or 9%? I think that you do, and I think that you also have to look at history. I mean, yes, you had a huge move last year and a handful of names, and yes, some of the other stocks started to catch up at the end of the year. I'm mean, just looking at a chart of L3 Harris before I come on here, and I was like, wow, that back end of the performance was really, really quick. I don't know where you end up with multiples here, but I don't think that you can have the kind of growth that we've had given the kind of economic backdrop that we're looking at. You know, if the Fed's really going to cut six times like the market is pricing in, then we probably have a much weaker economic scenario than earnings are pricing in. So I don't, uh, th there's a tension here and 2024 has got a lot of questions that need to be answered. You're the person I've been wanting to ask this question to. Uh, one of the big surprises last year was that the great underperformance came from oil. Tom and John were talking about why that was so <laughs> surprising, considering some of the conflicts that really were escalating in the Middle East. At this point, we are seeing oil perk up just a touch uh, in, rel in relation to what's going on in the Red Sea. Could this increase, if it continues, change the disinflation narrative? Absolutely. I mean, just the changing the trade routes alone could change some of that because you're going to things get more expensive. But you've had a huge supply response to oil demand. And you've got, you were talking about earlier, the U.S. is a huge producer now, right? Commodities are priced on the margin. If I've got excess supply, I can't get prices to really move that high, which is why the Saudis have had to keep taking oil off the market. But if you start to see a crimping of some of those routes and you can't move things the way you thought you could before, then you're going to see, then you could see some problems. And that's been a huge help for the inflation picture. And if that changes and you start to see data that is a little bit more inflationary, that narrative on how much the Fed's going to cut has to change. And then that's going to be a question of the when, then where do equity multiples go, given that scenario. I know that you were bullish on energy stocks uh, through the beginning of last year. Then you got a little more tepid as you saw some of the moves. At this point, how much are you leaning in to some of those names because of just how offsides people would be if the disinflation narrative fades and oil prices surge? Well, we think of energy as, a, as an area where you need to have some position, but you trade around that position. And you get heavier when you think that you've got an opportunity and you get lighter when you think that the market is not going your way. When the supply came up, a lot. That's where you sort of lighten up on your energy positions. I don't think you want to be out of it entirely. You've got a lot of very good dividend yields in those, and you've got a lot of stocks that act better in a bad market than some of the other things do. So I think that's something you want to trade around, and we still think that energy has a longer tail. 
you've got a barbell portfolio. You've got the short-term stuff for your day trading. We know you're famous for that, Sarah. <laughs> and then you got the buy and hold. I want you to talk to the audience that their heads are spinning off of COVID. They're stating, okay, COVID's over. Can I maintain some form of three-year or four-year or five-year ownership of whatever equity I'm comfortable? Can you still do that act? I think you absolutely can. And I think that this is a time to really be thinking about that thematic trade of what's going to happen in the next few years, right? So we look at something like TetraTech that does all sorts of engineering and construction, but basically on a lot of water and some of the infrastructure stuff. I think that you can definitely look at companies that have a longer term theme that are playing into some of the things that are going on. But the volatility within that, you have to be able to say, okay, this is where I will allow some volatility to occur. Because some of those stocks that, you know, we, that we like a lot still have had some challenges in a year where someone makes an acquisition or somebody does something. But I think you can look at thematic investing now because you really got a longer term view and you've got a market that's fairly expensive. So you better really like where you're positioned. Let's finish on the banks, the regional banks specifically, <laughs> not the big players, the regionals. KRE, closely followed regional bank ETF, you know it well, up almost 14% in November, up 16% in December. Is that just a leverage trade on what's happening in the bond market? in treasuries as yields fall aggressively? Or is there something to get your hands around for 24? I, I think that's a lot to do with what's going on with interest rates. And I think it's also a lot to do with people looking for, OK, where has completely still been on the floor? And maybe we can pick something up here because the valuations on that group were very, very not challenging relative to the rest of the market. I think you still have issues with the yield curve. I think it's still difficult to make some money in some of those. And I think we still have um, con commercial real estate issues that we haven't flown through yet. So it's a little bit challenging to say that that's a definite thing about about the environment as more as like it was being picked up off the floor. Speaking of the yield curve, Lisa, two year versus 10 years, still negative 36 basis points. They're not going to really make up some of the difference through lending long and borrowing short. To, to also Sarah's point, $117 billion of commercial mortgage debt coming due just this year alone. That's really going to raise some questions on that front it, with some of these regional it, banks. I read the same article, I believe it was in the FT, my brain's frozen on that right now. But the answer, John, is I saw a bar chart of, I'm going to say, 10 cities in America. There's basically New York and sum up all the others and maybe the, every other city combined is the same as New York. I mean, it's amazing how this is a local issue for us. Hey, Sarah, it's good to see you. <clears throat> Happy New Year. Good Sarah Hunt there of Alpine Saxon Woods. If you're just joining us, welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Look a little something like this. We're down 0.6% on the S&P 500. Yields are higher by eight basis points, 395.94. There's one stock to watch in the pre-market, though. It is Apple. Moving lower, Lisa, off the back of this move from Barclays, lowering our rating from equal weight to underweight. The stock is lower by 1.7%. The fact that the stock is lower by as much as it is really it's, highlights it's, the concern that people have out there of exactly some of the issues that Barclays have highlighted. Tom, I suggest that you're going to probably put out there, well, they've been wrong. They've gotten the move wrong. Yeah. They've all been behind. All the things are true. You are correct. But this is a big mystery. When will it matter that this is not the growth stock that NVIDIA is? I, I, I have huge trouble with this. I can't stand the phrase underweight. Is underway to sell? Is is I'm serious, folks. Everybody I'm not out there directly. in Global Weiss, you, Terry Weissman's over in the, the green room where you're aging right now off this. What in God's name is underweight? Barclays oh, can speak for themselves. I would just say that yeah. perhaps underweight is a marketing concept to make sure that you can continue to get engagement from the management team, Tom, without actually saying sound, even though you might mean You know, I, I, I said it was like, you <laughs> know, 3 p.m. on New Year's Eve. I said to Mrs. Keene, I said, I think we're overweight the champagne right now. <laughs> you know, That's what in God's meaning. name is underweight? That's a very different kind of overweight, Tom. Yeah. Underweight. Yeah, but I just, later. come on, Barclays is going Speaking to a cell. Come on, everyone a, feels the same way. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a ridiculous game to maintain you, access. Is we, Sarah Hunt ever underway? We're on the same page. No. Not champagne. <laughs> Not champagne, thank you. Here we go. Coming up in about an hour from now, don't miss this conversation, the biggest bull on Wall Street. John Stolfus of Oppenheimer Asset Management looking for 5,200 on the S&P 500 year-end this year. That conversation is just around the corner. From New York City this morning, good morning. Just a few days ago, uh, we issued what will be the last 
uh, drawdown package, security assistance uh, package for Ukraine that we have funding to, to support. So it's really important when Congress comes back to work here next week that they get uh, our supplemental funding uh, approved and passed so that we can continue the flow of necessary weapons and capabilities to Ukraine. Two big deadlines coming up over the next six weeks. That was John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson, speaking on ABC over the weekend, live from New York City. Here's the price action for you to kick off the trading week, the trading year. Equity futures pulling back by 0.7% on the S&P 500. Just a touch lower, Apple in the pre-market off the back of this downgrade from Barclays. Tim Long leading that effort, saying we believe the continued period of weak results coupled with multiple expansion is not sustainable. That stock pulling back 1.71%. I've got to say, Lisa, no drama in the context of the massive gains we've seen in the last 12 months. But certainly, I think that's the question a lot of people are asking already coming into 2024. Which is the reason why people are responding to a rather ambiguous recommendation to Tom's earlier point about what it even means to be underweight. But what this highlights to me is the fragility of the S&P's level to Magnificent Seven stock performance. How much that is the deciding factor and how much of a mystery that is heading into a year where a lot of people expect it to sort of trade sideways. How often does that happen? And that's that 100 futures pulling back by almost 1%, of course. The biggest weighting on that is Apple TK. Apple last year up close to 50%. You know, you lined up, John, as you did with the equity, you can line up the returns. You mentioned NVIDIA as an outstanding uh, uh, event last year. And the question is, what do the mainstream tech companies, Microsoft, Apple, and them do? And also the ones that are more at the margin. And then I'm fascinated by what nonprofit tech does. Goldman Sachs follows this carefully. And it had a bang up end of the year. Does that continue with these companies with non Profit. I love the idea that nonprofit tech means something different to different people. It's not someone who's going out of their way to do good. It's nonprofit, meaning no profits. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just, I mean, just clarifying for anyone who is confused. It'll be part of our discussion. Again, a highlight today. John Stolf is scheduled to be with us in the 8 o'clock hour. He's been right, and he is bullish, always optimistic. Is Amory Horton, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joining us desk side here uh, today. I'm going to go to the border first and the idea of the immediacy of do something. Define do something for the administration after the border dialogue of our sojourn, our, our Christmas sabbatical. Well, it's going to be an important topic this week because we have the current Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, going to the border, going to Eagle Pass, Texas on Wednesday. He's bringing a large uh, congressional delegation with him. And all of this is happening while we still don't have an agreement on the border. And what you just heard from Admiral Kirby, when it comes to Ukraine funding, when it comes to Israel funding, Taiwan funding, all that is being linked to the border. At the same time, we also don't have funding agreement when it comes to top, li top line funding figures. So we have these two potential Right. Fiscal cliffs coming up the 19th and the 2nd for different parts of government agencies that are going to be running out of money on those days. At the same time, they're right. trying to secure this massive supplemental package that is going to be money for a lot of foreign policy issues that the Biden administration wants, as well as money for the southern border, but also really what Republicans want is more tighter immigration controls, whether it comes to asylum or it comes to parole. This is where the conversations are. But the most important thing you need to know is no one is back in Washington this week. They all come back next week. So it's very difficult okay. when you look at the timeline and the calendar, trying to figure out how they get this done. I, I got eight ways to go here, but to give it some historical impact. I got Carlos Gutierrez, a Republican, former Secretary of Commerce, and I got Ted Kennedy of Massachusetts. And they're apart, but they're together on an immigration debate a, well over a decade ago, and it went down in flames. Is the debate any different now than then when it went down in flames? Well, it is curious that they think within a few weeks they can get an agreement on something that they've been discussing for decades. This is, as you say, Tom, generational debate. But potentially they could get something done because push is coming to shove when it comes to the timeline on getting something done on the border, especially with what you're seeing over the weekend, you're seeing migrants being dropped off in New Jersey because of some law that Eric Adams enacted, some policy they cannot be dropped off directly in New York City. There's a lot of pressure as well from Democratic cities and states on this administration. A deal potentially is there. Everyone says, you know, it's darkest just before a deal is done. And potentially because the Freedom Caucus members on the House side are going to nitpick anything the Senate sends them, it might be easier for everyone if it's done just before the deadline. Isn't this the big change of the last 12 months? 
there has long been a story where Democrats have been able to say there isn't a big issue here because it hasn't been the issue of blue states. It's now on the doorstep in those blue states, in those cities, in New York City and elsewhere as well. How are local state officials, regional officials squaring up with the White House's message and what the administration in D.C. is saying about it? Well, the administration sent out a letter to Congress uh, on top of asking for aid to Israel, Ukraine, foreign partners like Taiwan. They asked for more money also being sent to the southern border. This was a big issue for, say, Governor Pritzker, for, say, Governor Hochul, writing letters, calling on the administration, Mayor Eric Adams being very vocal about the failure of this administration when it comes to immigration and migrants at the southern border. Thousands of people crossing into the United States every day. The issues the Republicans have is not the funding going to the southern border. They're actually talking about making it harder for migrants to come into the United States, making it easier to deport them, making it harder for asylum seekers. And this is where the debate is really an issue. Um, but definitely at this point, there's a lot of pressure in this administration from those blue states that something needs to be done. So how much urgency is there? On the, on the behalf of the administration at a time where we are talking about thousands of people coming in and a real question about how certain states are going to pay for it. Well, there's a lot of urgency, especially because we're in election year. So the Republicans are also not going to want to give too much of a win to the Biden administration this year. So there's very little that can get done this year in Congress. It's the, you know, the second half of this session. They have to agree on funding and they're going to have to get the supplemental done. I think after that, there's nothing else that's, that, nothing else that's going to be able to happen. Republicans on the same side that want to keep their seats, potentially don't want to give a win to the Biden administration, but they have to go home with some sort of prize in November when it comes to re-election. And we are getting close to New Hampshire and we're getting close to some of the uh, early primaries. How much is there discussion in Washington right now about a different vice presidential candidate with Joe Biden? That's not a discussion in Washington. I think that's a big discussion around Wall Street, around people who think, you know, can you just flip up a ticket? Well, we're all looking that, at the polls yeah. and well, that's, thinking something's got to change, right? Well, at this moment, no, that's not happening. That's not a discussion. Are the polls getting worse? I mean, for President Biden, they've been pretty dim. I was going to say dire, but dim, dire, gloomy for him. Um, they, they are getting worse for him, I would, I would say. But again, they are sitting on a huge war chest. And at some point in the next few months, they're going to start to deploy this. And we have to see if it's going to work. Can we see some more engagement from them? I saw the president complaining about how the media has reported on the U.S. economy. And I can't think of how many interviews he's done on the U.S. economy. Isn't it pretty easy to get that airtime for the president? They can reach out to any network, offer an interview on the economy, and they'll take them. We'll take it whenever you're ready. And yet they complain about the coverage of the U.S. economy. I don't get it. I feel like you're baiting me because you saw my picture at the White House press Christmas party and said, what did you say to Biden? I said, I'd love you to do a Bidenomics interview on Bloomberg TV. Precisely. Um, they have, yes. Uh, the answer was a wink. So not, not exactly a yes, not a get? no. Wait, what, what from Secret Service showing you the door? I don't Pretty much. At all. You. They're responsible for their own marketing. <clears throat> not the media. And when you put out nonsensical tweets like the ones we've had on inflation from this administration over the last couple of months, that's not helpful. The data is in their favor at the moment. The trends look decent. Disinflation, unemployment. It's their responsibility to engage the media and have those conversations. I don't see that from this administration at all. Well, they will put out Secretary Yellen from time to time. Um, she does do a lot of speeches as well. And of course, you have Jared Bernstein out of the White House on the North Lawn, frequently briefing the press and going, going on interviews. The issue is the American people are still not feeling it when it comes to inflation. And their big issue is that the economy is number one priority, poll after poll. This is Without what the doubt. American voters care about. The media should not be the marketing wing of the White House. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the disconnect is about. Well, neither does anybody else. If you've read all the reports about the vibe session, the mystery yes. of the vibe session, yes, why precisely. is it? And all economists are saying we have no clue. I don't know. I want good vibes for 2024. Good vibes? Thanks. I'm offering you plenty of good vibes. <laughs>
call it negative 0.7 on the Nasdaq 100, lower by almost one full percentage point. Responsible for some of this move. Thank you, Apple, and thank you for the downgrade over at Barclays. Apple in the pre-market, Lisa, down by 1.8%, almost 1.8% lower. A move to underweight from equal weight. The iPhone 15 has been lackluster. We believe the 16 should be the same. Just to point out that the Magnificent 7 stocks account for some 28% of the overall S&P weighting. So if you start to talk about the significance of these stocks and the reason why we're focused so much, that's why. There goeth one name, there goeth the whole index. And that's sort of what we were set up for in 2023 and maybe 2024 as well. I got an overlay on Tuesday as well, which is we've got a lot of data Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I wonder if we're adjusting as well today away from Apple and away from equity markets to a little bit of angst about what we see, particularly on Friday with wage dynamics. Apple is 9% of the NASDAQ 100. It's the number one weighting, and that's it's why the real, NASDAQ I did not 100 is lower by about 1% know. this morning. The NASDAQ year to date, last year, on the year to performance, a gain of 54% on the Nasdaq 100. Let's turn to the bond market. Big moves lower in 10-year Treasury yields in November, again in December. This morning up by, let's call it seven basis points, 395.38. Are they talking about cutting rates? They're not talking about cutting rates. Are they kind of talking about cutting rates? Lisa, look out for the minutes in the next 24 hours. And will that determine anything or just be a further mockery in terms of where the credibility lies? Look, this bottom line is there has been a disinflation narrative that has gotten very far baked into market expectations. How how low is the bar for that to shift? Was it in the wage data? Is it in the oil prices? Is it in something else? And that's really what I'm looking for. Last year in reverse, just a little bit this morning so far, at least in foreign exchange as well. 109.67, we had seen 110 on the euro against the dollar. Last year, of course, the first down year for the dollar index since 2020, I believe, TK. The euro negative this morning, seeing a reversal of recent moves, but the Swissy TK recently. Well, Some really interesting levels out there in G10. Read my mind. As you know, folks, John and I really don't speak to each other, and particularly in the break. We didn't talk when, I, when he slipped in the door here this morning at 5.55. The answer is I triangulated. I looked at dollar Swiss. I looked at Euro Swiss. And, John, I went back and I looked at trade-weighted Swiss. For those of you on radio and CarPlay, it's real simple. The chart is jaw-dropping the appreciation on a trade-weighted basis of the Swiss franc. And John, this is really beginning to move. And I don't think, I think for global Wall Street, this is a major story to see the Swiss strength that we've seen. More on that in just a moment. Under surveillance this morning, your top story, oil rising, inching higher as tensions in the Red Sea escalate. Iran sending a warship in response to the US Navy sinking three Houthi boats over the weekend. This is Israel enters its next phase of war. Lisa pulling five brigades out of Gaza in the coming days. And this really goes to the conversation we were having earlier about the uh, domestic issues in Israel and the fact that the economy is struggling with so many people out of the workforce and fighting. I will say oil, I am so focused on this year. We were completely surprised at the end yeah. of last year of how much prices went down despite this conflict. How much of a risk is this to markets if prices go up? And it really challenges this concept of inflation steadily moving lower. As an amateur, I am completely focused on the domestic politics of Israel and Mr. Netanyahu. That's what I saw in the Zeitgeist over the last five, six, eight days. I, I think that's underplayed in the U.S. press. I need to turn to another story, Tom, <clears throat> out of Japan. The latest developments, a Japanese Brutal. Coast Guard plane colliding with a Japan Airlines flight at Haneda Airport in Tokyo. All 379 passengers and crew on board the larger Airbus 35900 aircraft evacuated safely, but five of the six crew on the Coast Guard plane confirmed dead. The smaller plane was carrying aid to northern Japan, where a 7.6 magnitude tremor hit the country. At least, at least 48 people have been reported dead. Did you see the images? Just of these incredible shaking Shocking. rooms. Shocking. And then the, the surf coming up and houses crushed, cars crushed. And then here's a crash, <clears throat> the cause of which still has not yet been determined, this according to local reports. What's going on? You know, this is sort of yet another sort of tail risk. Can you see it as it emerges for that economy? And people don't know how to price this in, but you have to really focus just on the domestic uh, humanitarian issue. And, in the, and looking the back over the last year, this, you know, what's going on, this just speaks to the risk of earthquakes, which are usually around very predictable fault lines, like the horrific earthquake that was in Turkey, in, in I'm going to call it southeastern Turkey here, X number of months ago. I mean, it's just, this is with us in our perfect modern lives. No, they're not perfect. They're not modern. 
the earthquakes. That's the latest on Japan. I want to finish on this story. The Biden administration cutting back on incentives for buying electric vehicles. The number of EV models eligible for a U.S. tax credit over $7,000 Cut it about half. Lisa, the new list, excluding vehicles that use battery components made by Chinese manufacturers. You're going to hear a lot about this in the months to come. I was looking at what that includes, which cars, right? So it's the Ford uh, F-150. Uh, it's a whole host of others. It's Stellantis. It's a number of them. It's Tesla, one model. It's interesting to see how much this is being done in the guise of trying to reduce any kind of benefit to China versus reducing some of the emphasis on these electric vehicle credits with a kind of shift that you've heard under the cover a little bit from the administration and from auto manufacturers as well. So if EV sales are struggling already, Tom, what happens when you lose some of that tax credit as well? Oh, that to me is the whole thing. What happens when the tax credit goes away? And I think that's something that goes directly into Tesla as well. Let's quickly get to Terry Weissman of Macquarie here on Global FX and all the other things that get us back to a great bull market in the United States. Wonderful to have you, uh, Dr. Weissman, to get us started uh, for the year. Let me go to the larger view, which is everything hinges on China. Do you agree? Not for 2024, no, although I do think that China is a very important part of the macro story globally. Uh, we have the central banks in, in the U.S. to worry about. We have the central banks in Europe to worry about. And we have supply shocks, especially in the natural resource markets and the oil markets to worry about, too. So China is important, but it's not, uh, it's not all or nothing uh, as it comes to China. Uh, I will say this, though. I think the market is somewhat... Um, wrong in focusing too much on the property sector in China and aggregate demand in China. I think what the market has lost sight of to some extent is uh, uh, President Xi's um, uh, willingness to go after the tech sector uh, in China and more generally, uh, uh, you know, against the, 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 uh, the, the whole concept of private mm -hmm. property in China. I think this is what is souring uh, sentiment for China. And I think to the extent that that is, find some relief in 2024, right. it could be a bigger deal for China on the upside than, you know, some resolution to the problems on the balance sheet of the property sector. There's been a multi-decade failure of international stocks, and some would correlate that over to an ever stronger dollar. Is the dollar finally broken where there's an unspoken opportunity in international equities? Well, if, if you're asking, is, is the dollar, is a lot, dollar is a reserve currency as the standard for international trade, and international dollar. finance is over. No, I, I know. I, I don't think so. If, we are, if what you're asking for is, is, is there going to be a structural break mm -hmm. with regard to the status of the dollar, in international capital markets and international trade, I think the answer is no. Um, remember that we had a period uh, before we had globalization, uh, before 1995 for that matter, uh, when China and Russia and the other emerging markets were not that fully integrated into the global economy or the Washington consensus for that matter. And yet uh, we still th talked about the dollar as the reserve currency uh, of, of the world. Why? Because it, you know, the, you know, a good part of, of, the, of the world still depends on the dollar. Uh, for its trade and for its commerce and for its, uh, it, its financing. So no, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon at least. One of the charades that we do at the beginning of every year is to come up with potential tail risks, which inevitably will probably be wrong. But there is a question here. Tail risk of the dollar being somehow profoundly debased it seems to be off the table from what you just said. What about uh, sort of the tail risk of some sort of significant supply shock? You sort of alluded to that initially in the commodity space. No, that, that I think is a bigger, bigger tail risk. And I think it behooves every investor out there to at least have some oil in one's portfolio be long oil. Because when you think about uh, U.S. recessions in the post-war period, you'll find an amazingly large number of them had been uh, preceded by a rapid rise in oil prices. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see that. And, and it, it behooves investors to have some oil in the portfolio because we just don't know. Uh, to the extent that we do have a supply shock, oil prices will go up and you'll offset the losses you would otherwise uh, experience from seeing stocks go down, from being, seeing bonds go down in that context. Well, this raises a question to me of how offsides the market would be should there be some sort of oil supply shock, given the fact that people have kind of come, uh, gotten accustomed to the idea that the U.S. is producing record amounts right. and that even in the face of conflict, oil prices went down. How wrongly positioned are people 
for this kind of a this kind of event. I, I don't know how wrongly positioned they are. They are. There, there's a there, there is a case to be made, however, for for the logic of oil prices having come down in the last uh, few months. And the logic is very straightforward. The the elasticity of supply in oil is actually quite high, and potentially higher than the market uh, surmised uh, before six months ago. Uh, what we have seen with the increase in oil prices that preceded this decline is a huge increase in oil production in the U.S. And that is the basis for why oil prices are down. But if we were to get a shock, a shock out of the Middle East, for example, a shock out of Russia, uh, it's not conceivable that production can go up quickly enough to offset that in a very you know, short period of time. And that's the risk that we face right now from these sh shocks. Uh, over the long term, there'll be an adjustment in U.S. supply uh, that's positive and beneficial, but not in the short term. Is the U.S. dollar a commodity currency now? No, I don't think so. Certainly the market doesn't, doesn't see it that way, right? It's interesting. There are some emerging markets that we don't necessarily associate that much uh, uh, from the perspective of their current account balance and their trade with oil because they're not huge net exporters, Brazil, for example, but they are large producers. And yet the market tends to associate the Brazilian real with oil more than it does associate the U.S. dollar with oil. Do you expect that to change anytime soon? No, I don't think so. And that's because you know, no one's going to really associate the U.S. Uh, with a, a very large uh, net export balance in oil. It really has to get to a point where uh, U.S. trade is dominated by oil, and that is not the case yet. It's still dominated by services and technology. Very true. TK, the number's just absolutely staggering when it comes to production. 13 million barrels a day in this country. Yeah, well, what's interesting is we don't have an oil policy. I mean, we take great pride that Washington has never come up with the plan. We've got this plan, that plan, whatever plan. I guess it's a technological success. Not sure we need one. No plan. Well, to that yeah. point, do we need one? Is Washington, is the White House irrelevant with regards to this conversation? Uh, only in respect that oil is such a geopolitical issue. Um, and, of course, geopolitics and politics generally have to be managed either through diplomacy or through some, some uh, management of, of market forces that, that are relevant to geopolitics. That's a case, there's a case to be made for the energy market to be managed from that perspective. But if it wasn't for the importance of oil from a geopolitical perspective, I don't think so. Terry, it's good to see you. My Happy pleasure. New Year. Thank you, sir. Terry Wiseman there of Macquarie. If you are just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 session lows. We're negative here by 0.7% on the S&P 500. I think every time, Lisa, we quote the price action this morning, we've also got a reference, the gains of 2023. Totally. 0.7% against the move of, what, 24% on the S&P last year. 107% for the Magnificent Seven yeah. stocks alone in one year. And these were the stocks that were supposed to underperform. To me, the shocking thing is, though, with all of those gains, incredible moves, we're basically back to the S&P levels that we were on January 2022. We're basically come full circle. And so now people say, are we just going to sort of middle through, which is essentially well, even the bull case, or is there going to be some sort of different paradigm in this In 2020, year? I'm going to go back to the habit, and you do see this in the earnings reports as well, as where are we from Q4 of 2019? And if you look at that, the answer is you've got double-digit equity returns, some would say off the Biden stimulus and, and the rest. But there's a habit here from last year that maybe we have to continue, which is how do we gauge ourselves in earnings, economics, from 12, 31, 19? How long does it take to get used to 2024, a new year. Do you remember when you were a kid, Tom? You have to uh, write down the new date. I, I, in May and June, I'm, I'm, I'm writing I'm checks stuck in, in May and June. <laughs> right? <laughs> the last three years ago. Exactly. Well, I feel exactly the same. I mean, yeah. Start doing 2025 early. You want to start now? <laughs> I mean, just get practice. <laughs> Come to the next year, you know, a little bit more advanced. Let's go. Okay. It's the price action on the S&P, pulling back by 0.7% on the S&P 500, pulling back a touch more on the NASDAQ. If you're looking for the why, Plenty of reasons. Maybe one, Apple, a downgrade from Barclays. The team at Barclays downgrading the stock from equal weight to underweight. The stock is negative 1.85% on Apple in the pre-market, 188.97. From New York City this morning, with equities pulling back as we kick off a brand new trading year from a beautiful New York City, this is Bloomberg. were the big tech enabled companies. They were safe havens, fortress balance sheets, great cash flow, great places to hide out in economic and, and political turmoil. 
Uh, we still have a lot of that turmoil, obviously, but you've got the Fed uh, wind at your back in 2024. You've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. So I think that gives some room for a broadening out of the market. Where is the market leadership coming from in 2024? That's the big question. An answer there from Chris Morangi, the co-CIO of Gabelli Funds from New York City. Welcome to the program. And once again, Happy New Year. Your equity market on the S&P 500 session lows, negative by almost three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500, following a massive year of gains on the S&P, on the Nasdaq as well. <coughs> Apple, responsible for some of the move at least, is negative by close to 2% in the pre-market, off the back of a downgrade from Barclays this morning, with Tim Long and the team taking a stock down to underweight from equal weight. Tom, we're negative there by 1.9%. There's some people out there that really agree with this. Frankly, they're looking at this huge dominant unit count of iPhones, which is without question the dominant strategic part of Apple uh, as well. Then there's a service sector ever building, and then there's that they're managing for profit and use of cash. And if, if this is a titanic battle, maybe this is the one stock where there's the harshest divide between, sure, Doug Cass later on Bloomberg Radio, he is short Apple. It's a growth stock, Tom, that went ex-growth. And still got multiple expansion. Yeah. And still delivered gains of close to 50% year to date last year. No, it's there. And, you know, there you, I, I think this is important, John. The Magnificent Seven or Eight, whatever it is, they're all different stories. I don't like that they get bundled together. There's a huge set of different stories there. Well, as Lisa suggested, when you do bundle that seven together, that seven delivered some pretty big gains in 2023. Yeah, 107 percent. It's not bad, is it? Well, but, you know, there was a lot of divergence. I mean, people say there's going to be divergence this year. There was a lot of divergence last year. I mean, NVIDIA was up 240 percent to the to the 50 percent of Apple. Huge divergence. I'm just thinking of the total return of the triple leveraged all cash You're just fund. pausing for thought? Yeah, no, triple leveraged all cash time fund for that. can't compete with that. There's no question mm. about it. We digress right now. This is important. We decided that EM in China is so important to year 2024. We took the great Terry Weissman of Macquarie, and we tag teamed him with Damien Sasso, our, our chief emerging markets credit strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. The importance this year of EM and this massive mystery of China, I called it out on social, the known unknown that's out there. Let's begin with first principles. Is China an emerging market? The politically, the way we treat with them, they're a developed economy. What are they? Well, they're considered an emerging market, certainly in my universe and fixed income, right? But I think what Terry was alluding to, and I think the real shift for me in the last few weeks, certainly since the Fed, has been in the factors that are driving foreign currency, foreign exchange returns globally, not just in EM, but in G10. And for me, that means it's a shift from carry, which has been the primary driver of outperformance across all currencies, whatever shape and size, since the pandemic started, to value. And we're starting to see that. We've had two consecutive months of negative performance in just about any carry index you see on the FX side, and now we're seeing value come back. So what does that mean for emerging markets like China? Um, it means funding currencies like the China Yuan, mm -hmm. which has been a funding currency, should start performing is, pretty well. Is China's credit rating off of the Moody's news last year, is it at risk right now? Fareed Zakaria in foreign affairs led with that yeah. idea of the credit rating of China. Are you watching that? Yeah, the Pledge Supplemental Lending Facility, which is the facility that China used from 2014 to 19 to rebuild their shanty towns, which caused the housing boom, which now President Xi is starting to unwind. They're back in the game with that now. They're, they're basically, I guess it's China's form of quantitative easing, call it what you will, but they are definitely plowing money back into the policy banks, and we're starting to see some evidence of that in the PMI data. How much pressure can a leader with no term limits be under? <laughs> Not that much. Um, I mean, look, I don't know the dynamics about what goes on inside of Beijing, Jonathan. I think very few people can say that with any sort of credibility, but you know, there's certainly a sense from President Xi that he's trying to repair some of the, I guess, tighter uh, policies that kind of have restricted the economy for the better part of the last two years. He's trying to undo that, but it's so difficult to undo sentiment, specifically domestically amongst consumers and households, when it's been damaged so utterly unbelievably. And talk about foreigners, forget about it. The FDI data just came out a few weeks back. It has been dismal. I mean, just huge losses. Nobody's investing there from abroad. So they're looking inward and it's just not working out. Whose confidence is lower? Consumers in China or investors looking into China? I think investors looking into China, certainly. How do you repair that? 
Well, I mean, other than a regime shift, it's going to have to be something more tangible than that, right? And look, I mean, you could say all you want, and we could bash China here till we're, but we could easily bash the Fed. I mean, look at El Arian over the break, you know, and and the Fed credibility issues. I mean, I, I I'm going to ch- I'm going to channel Chair Eccles again and say, my goodness, the communication's been awful on the Fed's part. That's what's kind of driving a lot of this regime shift we're seeing in FX. Um, and look, you know, I mean, the communication's been abysmal in the U.S. as well. So, I mean, for a speculator or a hedger looking forward, it's just difficult to kind of get a gauge on the market. So let's take the other side. After a whole year where people were talking about China being uninvestable and that foreign investment sentiment being uh, just at the very bottoms, can it only go up from here? I'm <laughs> hearing more and more people getting bullish on China just because things got to get better than this. And you have on the margins Xi Jinping having certain stimulus, maybe not as much as people want, but the latest being $50 billion of low-cost funds to certain policy-driven yep. banks. I mean, on the margins, kind of starting to respond a little it bit. It was the same argument that many investors made in the beginning of last year. Remember when we saw, you know, uh, the CSI, you know, kind of rally. And look, people who rode that up did really, really well. But if you held on to it, you had a loss on the year, right? So it is a very tactical trade. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to move Chinese equities in this market, I don't think. Um, but again, going back to FX, I think that's the real story. The carry trade unwind is real. Meanwhile, overnight, we got some economic data that wasn't so good out of China, but we also got economic data that wasn't so good from South Korea, from Taiwan, from a whole host of other uh, Asian countries in the region. How much is this a China problem and how much is this a regional problem? And can you just distinguish those two things? It's interesting. It's not just a China problem. It's more of a Europe and U.S. problem, right? It's the end demand. It's export orders. If you break into the PMI data and you look at export orders, export new orders, all of those gauges are down within the PMI. I mean, the one little kind of, you know, silver lining we saw was in the construction, and which speaks to all the funding, uh, all the financing that you rightly point out that the PBOC is using to stimulate its economy, but certainly from an export-oriented, I mean, right. South Korea, Taiwan, you just said it all. I don't think it's China. I think it's more U.S. and Europe and growth and, and a lot of what we're seeing on that front. Let's look at the emerging market, Switzerland. Ooh. I came in and triangulated dollar Swissy, Euro Swissy and trade weighted Swissy on Bloomberg Radio. We're showing the chart right now in trade weighted. John, in the middle there is when you and I were in Zurich or Davos, I can't remember where. And we're way beyond this with trade, uh, trade weighted Swiss strength as well. How disruptive is that? to any and all, including me. Well, the S&B surprised before break. They were a little bit more dovish than the markets were giving them credit for. I don't know if anybody was watching that. But, you know, the funding G10 currencies, of which, which you know, Swissy is one of them, Aussie dollar, Stokey is another that come to mind, maybe even CAD, all of them have rallied pretty nicely against the dollar here. Again, speaking to the strength of these funding currencies as the carry trades are slowly unwound in this environment. You know, again, I'm not a big buyer on the fact that you're going to see this massive dislocation between the ECB and the Fed, although that's what the markets is driving a lot of the price action lately. I think European growth is still a real issue, and I think even though they have this mandate on price, I'm not buying it. Let's go geek here. Greek letters. We need Greek letters. Yeah, yeah. uh, Risk reversal. Excuse me. Next to nothing. It's quiet, quiet, quiet out there. I have massive log convexity on any measurement of Swiss that I see. I've got an accelerative tendency of this carry unwind. What's it mean for our listeners and viewers? It means it's a, it's, it, that the market's vulnerable to a short-term reversal in what we've just seen. Basically, if you see one month, 25 delta risk reversals, which is the skew you're talking about yeah. in currencies, they are at or near three-year lows across more than half of the 30 major currency pairs that we track not just EM, but G10. So that means that those currency pairs are subject to a near-term reversal where the dollar is going to strengthen relative to the five-minute conversation with Damien and you didn't bring up college football. I was waiting so, for you. I mean, come on. I mean, come on, Alabama. Huskies. I was thinking of you. It's not uh, a classic Nick Saban team, is it? No, I mean, really no. Not. I mean, well, look, I mean, Mich- I mean, J.J. McCarthy, what? I mean, he engineered that fourth-quarter drive, the Mr. overtime Wilson, drive. A couple of the catches Mr. Wilson made. I mean, yeah, Mr. Wilson, but then, I mean, the Huskies, man. I mean, who's not going to talk about... What's the level of underdog of Washington since 1991. Four and a half point kind of underdogs, nowhere. I believe, is the kind of Vegas line going Say into. Again, three, uh, the, the Huskies are four and a half point underdogs. That's all. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, Washington's real team, real team. Your bet, Wolverines. Uh, I think the Wolverines are probably the safe money bet. You know, they're obviously the favorites, but I'm going to be rooting for the Huskies. I mean, I have a fondness going back to 1991 for the Washington Huskies. I mean. You know, I'm just a, a normal college football fan. Just a normal With visions of Pac-10, fan. which no longer exists. You're done, TK. You have to I'm, de- I'm just dazzled. Do you want to talk about I, the Red really Sox? Enjoyed, no, well, yeah, that was amazing. Shannon. Did you see what, what Mo Ellerian we'll posted about the Pats? radio Pats? yesterday. I mean, like, my God, the, the, the God went out. He went to the Braves. What's yeah. that about? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, look, the Dodgers are going to own baseball this year. It's really sad. 
Huh? They, they have everybody. Yeah, it's so certain. They got someone else, didn't they? Yeah, it's they got the picture. It's about a billion yeah. dollars. I mean, <laughs> it's the time but they don't have to pay it until 2050, so don't even worry about yeah, it. Yeah, that they have all the they have uh, of all course, of the yeah. they have all the luck because people are want to go there because it's L.A. Times. So Taxes. Tell, yeah, right. there's a lot of stuff. that helps too. That really yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. No, there, Damien, there's thank you. Conspiracy theory. Good to see you, <laughs> Damien Sasser. Solid missed that year. penalty shot and Liverpool. Then, then scored what one was later. That about? Then scored one later. Yeah, yeah. That's just sports, Jay. I think the bullishness is probably has a, has a wider window to, uh, to perform in uh, going to 2024. I think we're going to feel a little bit pressure on the big caps coming into the new year. I don't expect to see the Magnificent Seven so, trader in 2024. There's a lot going on that we think is very positive uh, and that the market is starting to sniff out. And that makes us constructive, not only through year end, but into 2024. The market, Brett, will continue to widen out. Um, but we do think that some of the leaders from this year will continue to be leaders for next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, 2024. In moments, we're going to talk to one of the great bulls of Wall Street. John Stolfus is going to join us from Opco. And John, what this is about is putting economics into stocks, and that begins with a busy economic week on the labor front and what it means for this bull market. We are absolutely hitting the ground running for 2024. We have payrolls on Friday, the following Friday, kicking off earnings season, unofficially officially with JP Morgan results, Tom, just around the corner after some massive gains, 24% on the S&P, more than 50% on the Nasdaq 100. Can we get some broader gains this year, Tom? Does the leadership start to change? It's about nominal GDP. I think Michael Darda are very much focused on the animal spirit of the country and all the mystery of that. And one theme, as we heard from Bruce Kasman, JP Morgan is, yeah, we get the good feeling, but the then what? I don't know where the then what is. Is it in May or is it in August? There's some big lessons to learn, Tom, from the last year or so. It's not just about eating humble pie over Christmas and saying that the economists got it wrong and the equity strategists got it wrong. It's about trying to learn which data points are relevant and which data points are totally irrelevant. And when you look back at the last year or so, the ISM manufacturing has been sub 50 in contraction territory, Tom, since late 2022 and the whole of 2023. That data point, if you focused on that, it would have taken you down the wrong path for the US economy. Tom, if you'd focused on something simple like jobless claims, that would have told you week after week, every right. single week, that things were okay in the U.S. economy. ISM tomorrow, and this is the important, there's two sets of ISM, right? And tomorrow we see ISM manufacturing and all the subparts as well. That's that first look that you look at, right, John? Yeah, and then on to services, TK, then on to right. jobless claims. And Lisa, I think we get jolts later this week as well, don't we? We get that, yeah, tomorrow we get that uh, at 10 a.m. I'm curious to see how this all feeds into uh, whether the U.S. can continue to fuel some double-digit gains in the stock market. We talk about the biggest bulls taking all of this mush and coming together with projections. The biggest bull is predicting a 9% gain on the S&P this year. <clears throat> that is not that much after the last year's 24% gain. The year before it was a 20% <clears throat> loss. The year before it was a 27% gain. There has not been a single okay. digit kind of gain or loss since 2018. But then CFA 101 is maybe you take it harmonically, which is if you got a 24% number in the rear view mirror, then you go to 12% the next year, then 6% to 3%. You bring it on down. I guess there's a lesser anticipation here but I'm sorry, there's just too many mysteries. I'm going to the Faro rule, Lisa, which is the year begins March 31. I got to recalibrate somewhere <laughs> out the first there. Quarter. No, <clears throat> we always start programs like this, Lisa, every single year, and we talk about consensus. And I think you're right to point out where the highest forecast is right now. The lowest 4,200, the highest 5,200. That is a 1,000 point spread. Lisa, I think any conversation about consensus is totally misleading <coughs> because when you go through all of the forecasts, the range is so wide for the equity market for the year ahead. There aren't that many people, though, talking about the same kind of tail risks as they were at the beginning of 2023, a catastrophic kind of recession, something terrible. No one is expecting that. There is sort of this feeling that we've dodged that bullet and there's going to be maybe a slow, soft landing, maybe it's a harder landing, right. but nothing that's going to really shake the boat in any kind of massive way. To me, that's the interesting thing, to the upside or the downside. Right. Where is that shock factor? To begin the data, John, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, Goldman Sachs has a good measurement as well. 11 ratios, I believe it is. And it has shocked me as this bull market of how accommodative we are. And we curve up and we're really getting out to some substantial 
societal and economic accommodation, which Chairman Powell has to deal with. Just a tiny bit more restrictive this morning, though. Just to go through some of the price action on the morning, on the session so far, equities pulling back on the S&P. We're down by 0.8%. Yields are a little bit higher. The dollar is a little bit stronger. Crude is running as well. If you want a single name, it is Apple. Apple in the pre-market is down close to 2%, which doesn't sound like a big move, but it's a major weighting, a major weighting on things like the Nasdaq 100 and on the S&P, the number one weighting. We're down by about 2.2% currently in the pre-market. Tom, following a downgrade from Barclays and the team a little bit earlier this morning. What is interesting here in the game is to look back at people that got it right. Yes, we look at the people that got it wrong always with great humility. But now John Stolfus joins, Chief Investment Strategist at Opco Oppenheimer Asset Management. And we speak to him about the bull market he nailed last year and continues to nail this year. John, I'm gonna take it back to the analog of the middle 70s, a horrific recession, the leap in 1975, and then a follow-on in 1977. Is 2024 a follow-on bull market? I, I think in, in many ways uh, it, it is, uh, Tom. I, I think the the question here really is, it, uh, or, or rather the difference is, uh, it's a substantially different background in terms of a digitalized global society for business and the consumer and what was back then, which was essentially an analog world. Uh, and I think things get digested much quicker uh, I think that the data is a better quality. And because we've been in crisis, in and out of crisis since uh, 2008, uh, all the players, as, as well as the, you know, the traders, as well as the investors, are more experienced with dealing with right. volatility. John, I think what's so important here is only Stolfus is talking about last year was a prelude. I just think that's so important. 5,200 price target. Yeah year end this year. John, let's build on that. You and I have talked about this a few times in the last few months, and I've appreciated it. Can we just address it right now? How dependent that call is on interest rate cuts from the Federal Reserve? Not much, really. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not of the camp that's looking for six cuts uh, uh, this year in 2024. Uh, we're looking for perhaps uh, one or two and uh, we're not looking for the first half for cuts. We think it'll happen in the second half of the year and likely later rather than earlier in the second half. Uh, the, to us, the Fed has been remarkably sensitive in practicing its mandate, uh, you know, for a stable economy and uh, uh, full employment as described by unemployment between three and four percent. Uh, and we think it wants to keep it that way. And so that's that's what we're looking at. We're a little bit different. We like the Fed, ironically. Uh, very few people do. We think the Fed has done, it shows the Ben Bernanke legacy carried on uh, through uh, uh, Jerome Powell in the sense of communication and clarity. So it might not necessarily, the rally might not be dependent on Jay Powell, but how much is it dependent on the central bank of Tim Cook? Uh, I, I, I would have to say perhaps, I'll, I'll keep it away from uh, company specific here, but I, I would say certainly a business, the consumer, and uh, and the jobs market will play an important role this year. Key word to watch for is resilience. Uh, when we look at economic data, what we're looking at is uh, for things to show resilience and naturally is a challenging uh, environment when you're making transitions, when you have the levels of of uh, trouble around the world, the geopolitical risk just seems to keep ramping up by the day. Uh, but consider uh, where business plays out in this, where the opportunities are, both the, the cyclical point where we are on the calendar, as well as the uh, secular trends that are driving potential growth for all 11 sectors. Okay, so in other words, does textile lead? I mean, I guess that that's the question at a time where that accounted for 15% of the 24% gain of the S&P last year. Uh, Lisa, I think tech is certainly remains a major participant in this, uh, but I think what we need to watch, well, of course, communication services, which is about 50% tech related. Uh, you also have, uh, when you look at the other sectors, just think about industrials and all the technology in that. And it's a good customer of technology, whether it's it's sensors or robotics mm -hmm. or what have you. Uh, and uh, the, the, the cloud, big data right. and all that uh, AI. Uh, so when we look at this, it's, 
it, you know, whether it's it, it's a utility company, whether it's a, a materials company, whether it's a, a pharmaceutical or a biotech, technology is where it's at. Right. So we can't help but think. The other reason is last year tech was it was fabulous in its performance because it had been so brutalized in 2022 when the bears sold all of tech. The long duration they sold because they right. were worried about re- Dancings, but they sold the good stuff that was highly profitable, positive cash flow, great products, and deeply embedded in the lives of business and the consumer. Yeah. John, the cliche is the boat has left the dock. I would guess a very large percent of the surveillance audience feels like they missed 2023. How do you get back in the game if the boat's left the dock? Yeah, uh, Tom, I would say for the people who, who miss this, I would say it's a question of, of layering in. It's not back up the truck at these levels. Uh, consider opportunities that show show up when you get some weakness uh, in names that may have gotten away from you. Look for babies that get thrown out with the bathwater in downdrafts to add to positions that you're building. Uh, and it, in essence, what, what you want to avoid is uh, just blindly buying dips. You want to be selective, even within what appears to be a nicely broadening rally uh, after, uh, as Lisa pointed out earlier, I mean, we're still back to the future in terms of the prices uh, of stocks in many cases outside the Magnificent Seven. And even there, they're, they're, you know, they've got, it would look like they've got plenty of, uh, headroom uh, available to move higher. In so many ways, we had a decade in a year, as Lisa and I discussed a little bit earlier on the program. John, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. Happy New Year. John Stolfus there of Oppenheimer Asset Management. Year-end price target, 5,200 on the S&P. He was bullish on the S&P last year. He was right to be. TK, when you get into the details of the call, though, not that dependent on rate cuts from this Federal Reserve. When you speak to John, that's not the big hole here. He's got an underlying 11% earnings growth. And the question is, is, as Lisa mentioned at the very top of the show, the multiple expansion question is just front and center. I, I got it wrong. Everybody else got it wrong. There it is. Now what for this multiple expanded part of the market? 5,200, though, and I just keep reiterating that, is 9% above where we closed. Single on, digit. Uh, right, from the previous, uh, at the end of the year. So at this point, that's the biggest bullish call. It's not necessarily calling for another massive returns year in the overall index, but what it's calling through for is a muddle through with these secular shifts in technology in other areas. Quickly here, this is critical because in CFA 101, 9% is a great year. I, we forget that, but 9% actuarially is a plus, plus, plus year. It's a rolling call for 10% upside, Bramo. You get the 10% upside, then you come out again and you call for another 10%. It's not that easy, obviously. If you aren't just joining us, welcome to the program, your S&P 500. Session lows are negative here by 0.8%. Responsible for some of the move. This move in Apple in the pre-market. Apple lower off the back of a downgrade from Barclays and Tim Long from equal weight to underweight. That stock is down by 2.3%. As we've mentioned repeatedly, though, through this morning, you can't quote that stock without quoting what we did over the last 12 months. Just go through some select names in tech over the last 12 months. Apple up 48%. Amazon up almost 81%. Who was talking about that? Hardly anyone talked about a stealthy 81% rally, Lisa, in Amazon well, over the year. Alphabet up 58, Meta up 194. Yeah, although not all of these stocks are the same story, right? We've been talking about that extensively. Amazon, uh, as well as Microsoft, with shares up 57%. That's stemming from some of the cloud computing, some of the generative AI, some of these other things. With Meta, it's the advertising that came back in bulk. With Tesla, it's its own sort of situation. But then with Apple, there is a question of people are not upgrading at the same level. People are not buying new iPhones. Yes, you do have people still shelling out thousands of dollars for their whole progeny and everything in their household. But at the same time, it's not increasing that much because people are running out of cash. Took a few hours to make this personal. I, you know, <laughs> I'm Only just warming hours. up. Just 2024. It takes well, a couple of days here, beginning of the year. So to, get to, get the, to, to get to the Bramo gloom, you know, we've got a... Is that gloom? It takes a couple of days. Mandeep like Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us on Apple and a downgrade from Barclays. The latest on Big Tech with Mandeep in just a moment from New York City. This is Bloomberg. were the big tech enabled companies. They were safe havens, fortress balance sheets, great cash flow, great places to hide out in economic and, and political turmoil. 
Uh, we still have a lot of that turmoil, obviously, but you've got the Fed uh, wind at your back in 2024. You've got an economy that has probably hit a soft patch, but I don't think it's going off a cliff. So I think that gives some room for a broadening out of the market. Massive gains in 2023. Can we get more of the same in 2024? That was Chris Morangi, the co-CIO of Gabelli Funds. Here's the price action this morning to kick off a brand new trading gear. Your equity market lower by almost 0.9% on the S&P 500. Futures on the Nasdaq 100 a whole lot lower, negative by more than 1% in the last hour. Off the back of this move on Apple, let's talk about it. Apple in the pre-market looks a little something like this. We're negative 2.4% near session lows. Off the back of this call from the team over at Barclays, they lower their price target only a touch from 161 to 160, still using a PE multiple of 25 times their full year 24 EPS estimate. But here's the quote, and I think the quote speaks to the general angst, the nervousness people have around this name. More generally, after a big gain of more almost 50% for the year 23, we downgrade our rating from equal weight to underweight as we believe the continued period of weak results, coupled with multiple expansion, is not sustainable. We also believe 2024, Tom, will bring more services risk to light. Now, that was a question we'd been asking through the whole of 2023, but the stock kept rallying. And I guess the question will start 2024 with as well. I'm going to go to technical analysis where you see support. And the answer is you see support in the NASDAQ 100. We're there right now. We barely pulled back even with today's angst. And on Apple, maybe it's a little bit grimmer chart sitting on support. It's been there since early November is, is well. We're, we're, sh we're so short-termism, John. We're just down to, oh, it's Tuesday morning. We've pulled back quick headlines. And so I just don't about buy it. The last 12 months, yeah. iPhone went X growth, which is why a lot of bears were bearish. The bulls were bullish because, Tom, if you look at the revenue mix towards services, higher margin businesses, that ultimately this can pick up and you get the cash machine continued to spit out cash, big capital returns yeah. program, and you get gains like the game we got last year. That's the bull and bear <clears throat> thesis right now into 24. And it is about technology, which is everybody's focus, those that have been in it and those that have missed it. And John, to have Anurag Rana with us at Bloomberg Intelligence, Mandeep Singh and everyone else that we have is a huge advantage that we lead with. Mandeep Singh joins us right now from Bloomberg Intelligence. Mandeep, good morning and happy new year. Happy new year. What did you make of that call from Barclays on Apple this morning? Well, so last year, what we saw was among the big tech, uh, you know, there were companies that had clear exposure to Gen AI on the cloud side, namely Microsoft, Amazon to an extent, and Google. Google has both ads and cloud. Apple was the one company where everyone kept doubting their product refresh cycle, and rightfully so. And till now, you don't get that conviction that you know, a large language model can run on a phone. Right now, large language models are running on data centers. We are going through a massive refresh cycle, and cloud companies are the major beneficiaries of that. We still don't know when that will happen, but we know it will happen. It's a matter of time. The large language models, the technology, the co-pilots will run on your phones. And right now, there is no alternative device except for your Apple ecosystem, whether it's your phones or your PCs. Just for AI specifically, do you suspect the winners of 2023 will be the ultimate winners. Any reason to believe that's not the case? Well, we are so early in this cycle that, you know, uh, these are multi-year trends and we know uh, from the past uh, year action that this is something that has a long runway. You're upgrading all your data centers. I mean, you will upgrade all your devices as well. Right now, you are in the process of upgrading all your data centers. Yes, the growth rates were stellar last year. There will be tougher comparisons. There will be a digestion phase. But the fact is, this is a multi-year cycle, and that is not going away. You do the most hardcore research on this that I've seen. And you published in the last days a terrific piece on the reality of AI. There's a satire group out on Twitter, Adweek, W-E-A-K, Adweek, it's phenomenal, folks. And they talk about in search after AI of the next bright, shiny object. Your bright, shiny object is $1.3 trillion in the next nine years in AI. What part of AI is real and what part of AI is the spoof of what we see from Adweek? Yeah, so look, I, I think the data center part is real. Training of algorithms, models, this is real. Your data centers, your devices are gonna get upgraded. Your ads are gonna be more targeted. You, whether you like it or not, these companies have more data. And, and that's where you know, there will be disruption. <clears throat> Software okay. as we know it 
it's not going to be used the same way. You and Anna Agrana together, how do you respond to, Lisa, am I right, the hysteria that's out there about AI? Everything is AI. Every ad agency is doing it. AI, AI, E-I-O. How do you respond to the hype of AI? Well, the hype is there are certain cases, especially on the healthcare side, you may not have the best data to make that 99.99% uh, call when it comes to giving someone advice, and you can't take a chance. We have seen that with autonomous driving. There are real challenges, and that's what companies are trying to solve for. You can't take risks with someone's life. So in the end, it comes down to the accuracy and the use case involved. And for most of the customer service use cases, a 99% accuracy is good enough because it gives you efficiency. Think of coding. I mean, we need a lot of coders around. If AI can help you expedite the way you code, that's a big productivity improvement. So those are the kind of gains you're going to see more of this year. And then we'll strive for the 99.99% use case. Which is uh, something that we'll parse through throughout the year, the details of exactly some of these use cases, which I find fascinating. I'm just focused on the fact that this morning we're seeing in that 2.4% drop, a $72 billion market value erasure from the S&P 500, from Apple. I'm just wondering what this tells you. You're seeing such huge swings on speculation in these behemoths. What that signifies to you of where appetite is and how much skittishness there is on the part of investors? Yeah, look, I mean, valuations have expanded and it was primarily driven by multiple expansion except for the likes of Nvidia, which grew into the multiple. Everybody else, it's more of hope that AI is going to generate incremental revenue. In the case of Microsoft, they've told us cloud is about 2 to 3% of their uh, Azure bucket. In Apple's case, we don't know anything when that uh, incremental revenue is going to come from. They don't have a cloud business, so it has to be a refresh-driven uh, uh, kind of incremental revenue. This is really important. Are you saying that without some sort of artificial intelligence overlay or some other new innovation at Apple, Currently, the multiple doesn't make sense. Well, it is at the high end of the historical range. And you go back in time, last 10 years, this is the highest multiple that Apple has ever traded at, even though it's uh, much bigger in scale than it used to be three, five years back. So clearly, there's a lot of hope and optimism uh, baked into the multiple. But we know they have the distribution. They own the install base, and that's where uh, Gen AI will be deployed. So there is a good reason to be optimistic. Apple is the odd one out. I would suggest the head scratcher, wouldn't you say, of 2023 of the seven? Yeah, because they don't, they haven't given us that incremental revenue bucket. That cloud bucket is what is missing in the case of Apple. You see that with Microsoft, Amazon, Google. You don't see that. And we know Gen AI is expensive. It's going to cost a lot to invest even for these companies. Maybe it needs to make an acquisition to drive that. And yet the stock still rallied close to 50%. We can talk about what that acquisition might be at a future date. Mandeep, thank you. Mandeep Singh there of Bloomberg Intelligence on Apple. And this session low is down by about 2.5%. The Nasdaq 100 down by about 1.2. The broader equity market on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Equity futures pulling back near session lows on the S&P negative by 0.8% on the S&P. Yields a little higher, up nine basis points. The dollar a little stronger against the euro, 109.57. That currency pair down 0.8% and crude rally in 73.30 uh, by 2.3%. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV on the open, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research, Samir Samana of Wells Fargo and Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets. Lisa, to talk about the data for the week to come, the earnings that come next week from JP Morgan and the big banks and the conversation no doubt will end up on rate cuts to be or not to be anytime soon. You sound so excited. Honestly, this is going to be a really interesting week. We're going to get some real key data points to hit the ground running as we start off. 2020. We're still 2024. 2024. We're not. We're not 2025 yet, right? Yeah, 2024. We'll be talking about 25 before you know it, right? <laughs> In a half. Maybe. Equities negative from New York City. Good morning. And 24 started on a Tuesday, a busy economic week. We'll talk about that in a moment. A market check for you with some challenges out there. Futures at negative 48 tenths of a percent down on SPX. 
And the Yanks seen in the VIX out more than a stick, 14.11. Go to cash lease at 1.66. To me, what it shows right now, what you can see is uh, sort of this question around what are the most overcrowded trades heading into a new year? And maybe that's what we're learning, Mm -hmm. as somebody pointed out, one viewer, thank you, because it does really highlight that uh, people seem to be really positioned for a soft landing and a continuation of what we saw last year. And it's got to be a reset here after all the positioning into a crazy, illiquid vacation kind of a week. I know you were day trading on the ski slopes. And the answer is, uh, the bottom line, we're back and we're repositioning and it's a reset very much correlated across equities, bonds, currencies, and commodities. I want to mention oil, Brent crude, 78.53, up a dollar. I will just point out in terms of positioning heading into this year, and no, I was not day trading from the ski slopes. I will just say that a Bank of America uh, survey that was conducted in December found that fund managers were more optimistic than in any other month <laughs> since January yeah. 2022. And they're talking about being the most bullish on stocks right. since February 2022. Now, the economics matters. I like what Tony Dwyer published this morning with Canaccord Genuity. He said, in investors are giddy. I don't know if Jerome Powell's giddy, but Tony Dwyer's giddy. Well, maybe there'll be some soberness uh, to the giddiness when we get some economic data. The first week of the new year, we'll have a slew of it. We kick things off today with the S&P Global Manufacturing PMI, followed by jolts and Fed minutes tomorrow. Thursday, we get jobless claims in the ADP report, which no one cares about until they do. And on Friday, the December payrolls report. Key in there, really a question around wages and whether a 4% year-over-year gain in wages is commensurate or consistent, I should say, with this idea of the Federal Reserve cutting rates by six times in 2024. Joining us is Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, kicking off the year. Mike, how much are uh, people looking for a sense of this data being the important ones to really focus on? Well, the inflation data that we get later in the month is going to be the important thing because, of course, the Fed is tying everything to the PCE numbers and uh, the CPI is the sort of warm-up act for that, and everybody's going to be looking at the six-month average rather than the year-over-year because we've been making progress there. But the jobs numbers are going to be important because of this whole argument that you can't have declining inflation without rising uh, unemployment because demand has to be destroyed. And there is a forecast for 3.8 percent, a tick higher uh, unemployment. So that's something to keep an eye on Friday. And then the total job creation. The, the idea is that we need to slow down or we won't see the kind of soft landing that we're looking for. Right. So far, that hasn't worked as a theory. Are, we'll see this week. Are we still in the throes of the pandemic? I mean, I find it fascinating. This is weird. We actually moved on. We have moved on, uh, and we are starting to see a normalization of the economic data, while at the same time, health experts are telling us that the pandemic is raging, that there are more cases of COVID out there than there have been in months and months and months. It's just that with the vaccination levels, I guess, and whatever natural immunity people have gotten, Mm -hmm. um, it's not the crisis that it was. But that doesn't mean it can't come back because this COVID virus keeps mutating. You put me in the McKee timeout chair once years ago. You said, Tom, jolts matters. Does jolts matter tomorrow? Matters less than it had been. It's uh, still a question of how many uh, job openings there are and whether they're still declining. Chris Waller on the Fed uh, was the he was right. He said we can bring down inflation with a softer labor market by absorbing the vacancies rather than creating more with unemployment. And that's what's happened so far. So if that continues, it'll give people a better feeling about the Fed. I want to finish up with a real question for 2024, which is the vibe session that everyone was talking about, which is if you look at the economic data, it looks pretty good. You talk to people, they feel terrible. Do you have any sense of what explains that? Because I've read so many economic reports trying to explain this mystery, and everyone seems to disagree. Well, there there are a lot of different reasons why people think this may be happening. One of them that gets a lot of credence is that uh, it's recency bias. People are not looking at the change in the uh, magnitude of inflation. They're looking at the price level that we reached, and they look at uh, food prices, and they look at house prices, and they think that inflation is still out there. Uh, gasoline's telling them something different. We're starting to see a little change in consumer sentiment. So maybe uh, the vibe session, to the extent there is one, will start to change. Joe Biden, I know, is certainly hoping for that. And the good news is that maybe, uh, according to the weather people, we might get some snow this weekend. And then really? those that. who are going to go yeah. day trade from the ski slopes yeah, will probably. actually have some snow 
Very Some of us might have already just, looked at just, that yeah. weather forecast. <laughs> let's move on. Good to know. Let's, let's move on. Michael McKee is going to move on to three very busy days of economics here for Bloomberg um, surveillance. This is a joy. Aditya Bhave joins us right now. Senior U.S. economist at Bank of America Securities with Parchman from Chicago. And one of the great things he does is focus on the American consumer. That's 70% of the American economy, give or take a percentage point. It's a 70% solution for every economic analysis, and it's a good place to start 2024. What is the strength of the American consumer? So we think the American consumer looks good. That's the bottom line. I think if you start with the foundation of an unemployment rate less than 4% and wage inflation more than 4%, that is a great starting point for the U.S. consumer. You look at spending through the holidays, November retail sales look solid. Our card data through the second week of December look pretty good. And then you look at travel. Right? I think travel is a great <coughs> indicator of how the consumer is doing. It's, a, right. it's discretionary, and then it leads to more discretionary spending. When you fly, you go to restaurants, you spend money at hotels, entertainment, and so on. And the TSA's travel data look great for okay, the holidays. I'm lost. It's a 70% solution for the politics of America to the presidential election. Bankruptcies have surged. There's all sorts of credit card. Lisa, you're better at this than me. The credit card gloom out there is tangible. There's all this worry and angst. How do you process that versus the optimism you just stated? Right, so credit card delinquencies are a point of concern. It's something that we're watching quite carefully. We're watching student loans. These look like modest to moderate shocks to consumer spending, but if you look at our card data, one of the things you can do is you can slice it in ways that you can't do with the official data. You look at the, the cut by income, you see that lower income households are actually spending at a faster rate year over year than higher income households. So that has remained the case for several months and that keeps us quite optimistic. Is all of this optimism and all of this strength and resilience consistent with inflation getting back down to 2% with the Fed cutting rates six times this year? I think that's part of the story. Real income growth has been much stronger over the last few months because of the slowdown in inflation. And yes, the vibe session is certainly uh, a concern, but people keep spending. So it is one of those things. I, I think the answer uh, around price levels, sticker shock, is certainly part of the story. But the point is that folks keep spending and it's pretty broad. The pickup in durable goods was really impressive last year. We'll see if it continues. So it's not just revenge spending from COVID. It's broad-based consumer spending. This raises this question, and actually Andrew Hollenhorst of Citigroup just published and talked about how this is going to be a more difficult 2024 for the Federal Reserve than many people are giving credence to, especially given the fact that housing prices, uh, which had been challenged, the housing market seems to be the housing recovery now. We're seeing that in building yep. sentiment, and even home prices. We're seeing wages, as you mentioned, go up. Is this consistent with inflation continuing to come down without some consistent restrictive policy from the Fed? Right, so that's the question, right? The Fed has declared victory rather early. Um, it was a remarkable performance by Fed Chair Powell at the December press conference. Uh, it wasn't just that the data are moving in the right direction, it was also that the reaction function of the Fed seems to have moved, certainly more than the ECBs, a little bit less cautious. And now the question is, you get all this easing of financial conditions as, the, as a result of a more dovish Fed, and will that preempt the, the, the slowdown in, in inflation? So certainly supply expansion has helped, supply recovery, if you will, and that's brought inflation down. By definition, that doesn't hurt output. But the question is now, how much de dis demand destruction do you need to actually get all the way back? to What is service disinflation doing? I mean, the consumer is paying a lot for service inflation right now versus goods inflation. But is there a legitimate service disinflation? Oh, for sure. So core services X housing was running at around 5% early last year. Now it's at 3.5% year over year. You look at the six-month rate, it's actually well below 3%. So this is something then that Chair Powell noted. what are we waiting is. for? <laughs> That's exactly why we have the Fed cutting I four times next year. I got some news here. Rate cut, Jan was it January 15th? <laughs> Stop. Rate cut? Come on. <laughs> we, we have four cuts Cape next year watching. starting in Come March. On. You know, starting in March. Yes, yeah, starting in March. There you go. Well, can we just finish up with the vibe session? Sure. Because I really have been spending a lot of time trying to understand this. Yep. Because you don't, you can't discount what people are feeling. If people are feeling bad, there usually is a reason for it. But as you pointed, there is some inconsistency with how people are spending and behaving versus the sentiment surveys that have come in dismally time and time again. What's your theory for this? 
So I think it's sticker shock. Here's a fun fact for you. The uh, University of Michigan index is still below April 2020 levels. It has not recovered since it collapsed with the surge in inflation. I think it's just that folks are seeing prices when they go to the grocery store, when they go shopping, that they're just not used to seeing. And yes, they have the spending power, but it's still unsettling. And it's going to take a while for folks to get used to these higher price levels because the Fed isn't trying to get prices back, right? It's just trying to get inflation back to 2%. So we're probably stuck with higher prices in the long term. And there have been a number of studies I know that show that people care more about the prices they pay than how much their incomes are going up and that it matters more, the sticker shock. How long do people have to wait before something becomes normalized? Is there a historical analog? It's a tough one. Um, really, the last wave of inflation that we had that's similar to this is in, in the 70s and 80s, and that's just one data point. And the, the UMICH survey doesn't go back before that. So it's, it's, it's going to take a while, but I think we're slowly inching back towards normal. Why, why do we have to wait to March for a first increase? I don't, I don't get this. I just, you know, let's get going. I mean, one little rate, rate cut in January is going to upset the apple cart? Well, no, but I think it's a signal of more to come, right? If they, if okay. they cut in January, the markets are going to, they're already pricing six. Right. They're probably going to price seven or eight next year. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Aditya Bhavi with us with Bank of America here, particularly on the American uh, consumer. Right now we're consuming data here in the Bloomberg Terminal Futures, uh, negative 38. Dow Futures, negative 215. And I wait to the tape. Apple, are you going to tell me this? Uh, Apple, Apple, are you going to tell me Lisa's the reason for this? Lisa, are you going to tell me <laughs> Apple's the only reason? I don't buy it. No. Well, I buy it. It's, it's the beginning of the year and people are resetting. I'll give you this name as well. Rivian uh, plunging uh, this morning, down more than 8% in early trading after come out with deliveries that were below expectations, saying they delivered 13,972 vehicles versus an estimate of north of 14,000. And you can see the move now has been retraced a bit to 4.4%, yeah. but Tesla came in a little bit um, with a beat. These are some of the tea leaves, but the big moves are telling you kind of where some of the uh, maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, crowded trades might be. Well, the, the, the Tesla's there, and I don't know if it's part of the Magnificent 7 or Magnificent 8, but it's always in the news, and frankly, it's about EV as well. On the markets right now, negative 37 on the Standard & Poor's 500, and we are down uh, seven-tenths of a percent. I'm looking through these numbers, and it really is interesting to see that even Tesla came in below expectations for the three uh, Y deliveries. So this coming at a time where there's a lot of one, uh, skepticism around how long some of the buying trends can continue. We have seen Ford pull back from some of their projections of electric vehicle adoption. We see now uh, the fact that subsidies are not going to be as great from the U.S. government for a number of different models that use certain parts that are derived in part from China. So right. there are real questions here. How sustainable is it? Stock action here in the boom of the end of the year. Tesla 200 up to 260. I'm going to call it. it comes down to 250 something. And we're off a little bit here. 248 right now is the pre-market uh, here on Tesla. Yeah, pretty much flat. I mean, honestly, how much can we really read into an entire year for the first day? We're going to try, but it's really a fool's errand. At this point, I think we're setting up, though, with a series of assumptions that we're going to get some sort of gradual muddle through economy. And that's going to be the real question behind a lot of these idiosyncratic stories. Do we get that, or yeah. is it going to look a bit different with a bit hotter inflation and a bit hotter and consumer? Certainly, the zeitgeist at the end of the year was a study of EV worldwide, of China, and how China redounds over to all the restrictions of importing into the U.S. versus some real import penetration in Europe uh, as well. Coming up, this is the interview of the day on technical analysis. Urian Timmer, Global Macro Director, Fidelity, Boston. Good morning. I think the economy is in a healthy position here. I think it will take higher rates to be sustained here to continue to bring inflation down. Inflation is not going to stay high as it was over the last two years, but I think getting down from three to two is probably going to take more work. And I think it's not going to happen quickly. And as a result of that, I do think the Fed is probably going to be disappointing here.
relative to the speed at which rate cuts are priced into the market. That was Bruce Kasman, chief economist and head of global economic research at J.P. Morgan. As we look at a new year, a new trading week, a new trading day with a bit of softness as we parse through just a touch of weakness. But really, at session lows are a little off session lows now, a tenth of a percent decline on the S&P. A bit of dollar strength, a bit of a reversal in some ways of what we saw over the last three months of last year, including a lift to crude on the heels of Iranian ships entering the Red see in response to uh, some of the attacks from the Houthi militants and then the reprisal from the United States. Tom Keen, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow off to the 9 a.m. hour. But I really think it's going to be an interesting week to set up the year, Tom, to understand what the consensus is Uh, and how much it can go wrong. I think we've underplayed it here with all the equity chit-chat. And the answer is it's an exceptionally interesting week. It's just framed by the gentleman from Bank of America. And, and, and the answer is we get the labor data and within it the wage dynamic. And that's the key determinant to keep the bull tone going. Is It is about economics at the end of the day. Just want to run through some specific stocks to continue the stock chit-chat, as you mentioned. Uh, Apple shares very much getting our attention as Barclays becomes bearish, or at least marginally so on the side the edges down 2.2 percent. But again, that's like a 65 to 70 billion dollar market cap move. You're also seeing Rivian uh, lower by four and a half percent after disappointing with their deliveries uh, south of 13, uh, 14,000 vehicles versus the estimate of more than that. And Tesla basically flat. To me, again, I think it's notable that Apple has moved so much, Tom, in response to not that significant of a proclamation, just basically a recognition of reality. Yeah, well, the, the, that's the opinion of one house, Barclays here, that, that Apple's going to be a little bit tepid. But I think also it's just a normal beginning of the year reset. Everybody's back. Everybody will be back over the next week into the uncertainty of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And on this Tuesday, it's a reset, which is beyond healthy. We're allowed to go down every once in a while. Well, there's this real key question, which is, is too much good news being priced into this market? Jurgen Timmer asked this question in his recent note, director of Global Macro at Fidelity Investments. I'm going to ask you that, especially at a time where it seems like people are maybe questioning <coughs> that bullishness at the end of the year. Well, So I think the bond markets move and the market's interpretation of what the Fed is going to do um, is a little extreme, right? Um, So if if three is the new two in terms of inflation, which is my my uh, my my view that it's going to be hard to get inflation and core inflation below three and the market, you know, the SOFA curve is saying Fed's going to go all the way down to three. That doesn't really make sense in a soft landing, right? Because that would be a zero real rate if inflation's three and the Fed's at three at at a time when the economy is actually doing okay. So I think the bond market's a little bit over its skis. I think for for 10 year, for the 10 year yield, four to five is a reasonable range or below four doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So my sense is I'm I'm bullish on equities. I think we're gonna have a bullish broadening, uh, but certainly kind of, you know, sober January, if you will, uh, we might have a little bit more of a sober tone. And remember, market goes up two thirds of the time, which means it goes down one third of the time. And so maybe we kind of come to reality a little bit here. Let me begin weeks. with an open question. Your charts are the powerful use of overlay. One idea, two ideas, a third idea, all on top of the Euclidean surface. Which is a single chart right now that matters for people who want to find the courage to get in Will Danoff's contra fund? <laughs> Weekly chart of SPW, which is the equal weighted S&P 500 index, on a log scale, of course. If you take a weekly chart, you will see a stair step function. Are or we pattern. on one standard deviation above long-term trend? No, we are below the long-term trend. Um, if you go back 150 years, we are slightly above the long-term trend. But if you look at SPW, uh, <clears throat> we've been in a holding pattern for two years. Market generally goes up 10% per year, two thirds of the time. And to be going sideways for two years is a long, long time. And so, uh, and of course, as we know, it's been the Magnificent Seven. So many, many other stocks have not participated, which is a great second chance for investors to actually participate if they've, if they've missed this. Um, so that, I think, would be my primary chart. If you look at it a slightly different way, S&P 500, cap-weighted index, we are a little bit above that long-term uptrend. Obviously, a lot of very uh, benign, soft landing uh, dynamics being priced in. I don't think the Fed is going to deliver what the market 
is expecting. The market's like a spoiled child. You know, the, the, the Fed gives it three rate cuts, the market wants six, never happy. So I do think one of the stories for 2024 will be uh, the Fed walking back some of this very dovish narrative. There could be a, a situation where, yes, you do see a broadening out in some of these uh, sideways moving stocks over the past two years outperforming. Does that even matter, though, for the overall index if you have the golden children of the whole uh, of the whole past cycle, which is the Magnificent Seven, not performing in suit? Well, that is one of the great uh, unresolved questions for this year, right? Because the, the Mag Seven uh, are 30 percent of the index, right? So if you get a rotation out of those seven stocks into everything else, uh, 493 of the, of the S&P or the Russell 2000, what happens to the index, right? If 30 percent is being rotated and, and that just being seven stocks into everything else, can the tape be up or is that a more muted tape even though under the surface the market is broadening, which of course is what's, what's very important. So it's kind of the alpha versus the beta. Uh, and I think the alpha is going to work. The beta, I think, is, is kind of a math question. We know that historically when breadth is extremely narrow, so fewer than 30% of stocks are outperforming the index, it tends to be in rising markets, sometimes peaking markets, so the late 90s, the early 70s, come to mind. And when the market is broadening, more often than not, the market goes up. But again, you have this math tension of it being so concentrated. Do you find that the big tech stocks are more interest rate sensitive and would suffer more from some of the positivity that you're talking about that would keep rates higher? Uh, in part. And when, we, when the market started its bear market in early 2022, two years ago, almost exactly actually as of tomorrow, um, those were the stocks that were initially hits because they are long duration stocks they are sensitive to interest rates. Um, so it's ironic that that's how the bear market started. And then last summer, those very same stocks, when yields went to 5%, were seen as immune from that because they had so much cash flow, they didn't mm -hmm. have to borrow money, they didn't care about interest rates. And of course, we had the whole AI vibe going. Uh, so it's interesting that you know, different, same stocks, same environment, different outcomes. Right. But the rest of the market, you know, the financials, uh, dividend payers, companies with maybe weaker <coughs> balance sheets, more interest rate sensitive, that vice of tighter liquidity conditions, when that gets lifted, those stocks can finally yeah. lift as well. I remember you as a young whippersnapper. It was like 10 above zero. Peter Lynch and you were walking down Devonshire. You know, he's in his shirt sleeves with value lines in his hands. And the bottom line, we forget about this, folks, the great Peter Lynch. Fidelity Magellan in 49 years has given me a total return over 15% per year. How much of America's gloomy and doesn't believe in what Lynch and others have done. They don't believe in the equity advantage. To me, it's overwhelming now, the equity gloom that's out there versus a number of decades ago. Yeah, I mean, it is still the proven store of value, the proven way to compound wealth. Um, and compounding works, of course, not just in the markets, but in careers and everything else. You do a little bit at a time right and over the long term it compounds. Uh, it requires patience. Not everyone has patience. And when you have these lopsided um, market dynamics, um, that well, can get me, lost. Let me cut you off. Has Lisa Bramowitz and financial media destroyed this because of the immediacy of watching Bloomberg surveillance every day? We don't, you know, um, we didn't have happy this New media year, Tom. confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, one of the great things I learned, uh, not, not so much from Peter, but from his successor, Bob Stansky, uh, yeah. was, you know, I would come to him saying, I think the market can go down 10 percent. He said, good, I can buy some more because the fund was so big that it, it took the opposite approach of what maybe everyone yeah. in the media thinks. So being a liquidity <laughs> provider and a liquidity Why are you taker, looking at Bramble like that? Hold on a second. Like no, no. Just to set the record straight. There is an important role for honest skepticism on the way down and on the way right. up. And this morning, I've been saying, the fact that the bull case right. means an up and only 9% tells you where people and are positioned for total returns. I think it's fair to be great. skeptical. That's our job. And Bob Stansky would say, here's the door, Yuri and, Yuri and Timmer. Thank you so much with Fidelity, of course. It is an eventful four-day week. It's Tuesday. Don't forget that. Jobs, lots of economic data coming up here in the next three days. And we'll have all that coverage for you. On radio and television, Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning.